her needs. And you learned how to not ignore yours. I discovered how to make healthier meals. And I discovered how much I enjoyed them. Becoming a caregiver is a learning experience for everyone. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome to County Report this week. I'm Lorna Vigili, and thank you for watching. This week on the county's Spanish language radio show, we had Marisela Cordova of our Transportation Department and Purple Line Program Manager as a guest. We talked about the construction process that begins in January in downtown Silver Spring, which will take several months and will impact vehicular, pedestrian, and cyclist traffic in the area. We're about to start a very exciting piece of the project. Um, it's also one of the most complex ones. So a lot of impacts from the construction are going to start in, uh, they're happening, but they're gonna get worse in, uh, in January. So we have to stay alert and stay informed and pay attention to our surroundings at all times for sure. The Purple Line is a 16 mile light rail system that will connect downtown Bethesda in Montgomery County with New Carlton in Prince George's County. This east-west line is expected to carry passengers from one end on the route to the other in about 40 minutes. The Purple Line will have 11 stops in Montgomery and the project is expected to be operational in Prince George's by the end of 2022. This system will be fully operational by the end of 2023. For more information, visit purplelinemd.com. Executive Mark Elrich will be hosting the last budget forum to seek input from residents about the fiscal year 2021 operating budget priorities. It will take place on Monday, December 9th at 1.30 p.m. at Leisure World. These forums allow residents to get information about the priorities taken into consideration while preparing the budget and also allows them to give input directly to the county executive. For more information, go to MontgomeryCountyMD.gov. County Executive Mark Elridge and County Council Vice President Sidney Katz are invited local business owners to attend and participate in a Ford Business Charette as part of the benchmarking to be the best for business initiative. The next Ford Business Charette will take place from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. on Monday, December 9th at the Wheaton Community Recreation Center. For more information, visit the Ford Business webpage. 400,000 households in the county will be receiving a postcard in the next few days. The Department of Environmental Protection wants county residents to be aware of a new pesticide law that restricts the use of certain pesticides on lawns, playgrounds, mulched recreation areas, and child care facilities. All the residents are going to be getting um, a mailer here now. It's, it's come at me and I've gotten it yet. And it's going to help you uh, understand what you're allowed to put on your lawns. Uh, going forward, uh, the objective is to reduce the amount of pesticides being applied to lawns in the county, and it will give you the do's and don'ts. Restrictions do not apply to control tree and household pests or biting insects. For a full explanation of exemptions and for more information about the pesticide law, visit montgomerycountymd.gov slash lawns. During his monthly Montgomery County Public Schools press conference, MCPS Superintendent Dr. Jack Smith explained the purpose of the district-wide boundary analysis. The school system, as everyone knows, is engaged in a district-wide boundary analysis. The key word there is analysis. It's a study. The study uh, conversation started last January. 
Uh, the board worked through the spring and summer and put out a request for proposals. And WXY Incorporated was the vendor that was identified to work on behalf of Montgomery County Public Schools. And they started work in the early fall, right when school began. And they've launched the first phase of the district-wide boundary analysis. This work will go on the rest of this winter and through the spring. And a report will come back to June. Uh, come back to the board in June. A report will come back. WXY will analyze various data points such as school facility utilization and capacity, student demographics, school assignments, and travel patterns. They're going to look at a lot of things. You can find all sorts of information on our website about this. What they will not do, what they will not do is make recommendations about changing the attendance areas, the boundaries of schools, or decide who's enrolled in what school. They will not do that. That work then will be used in the future by the board as they see relevance and usefulness in the work. And they will look at where we can use the information that comes from the analysis in utilization, in expanding diversity, in creating better geographic patterns, better travel patterns. And remember one of the factors is sustainability of enrollment. In other words, if you are moved you know, if you were moved last year in a boundary uh, study and redistricted, then the district has made a commitment and policy that that won't happen to you again during your experience in that particular school. Coming up on County Report this week, the city of Rockville's mayor and newly elected council are sworn into office. And get ready for a favorite holiday tradition. Winter lights have gone up in Gaithersburg. Stay with us. County Report this week. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Adam Ortiz here talking to you about how to gift outside of the box this holiday season. So there's a lot of things that we can do to give to our loved ones while giving back to the environment. So one way is to give the gift of energy savings. So a new air filter or LED bulb, stuff that you can pick up from your local home improvement store can go a long way. Also using reusable materials as gifts, such as this water bottle or this reusable bag are a way to uh, save our environment and look cool while doing it. Also, if we have to buy stuff, there's a lot of resources right here in our county. So from the Agricultural Reserve, there's lots of fruits and craft beer and wines and things that we can buy, as well as arts and crafts from around the area. We can also give the gift of experiences, so a gift certificate for a dance class, a massage, or yoga can go a long way while providing a low carbon footprint. So this holiday season, as we give, let's not be a screw to the environment. These ideas and more are available on our website, and we're wishing you a very happy and safe holiday season. Welcome back to County Report this week. I'm Lorna Vigili. A local resource fair helped several people who experienced homelessness throughout the county. My MC Media's Jordan Lindsay spoke with an attendee, and she has more. This is Stacy Sloan. She says she's been homeless since October. I think it can happen to just about anybody, um, especially when you have an altercation with a family member that I was staying with. I was staying with my father, and and being put in jail. That's why on Thursday she attended the Nadine Khan Memorial Homeless Resource Day in Gaithersburg. Because I really don't have, you know, my stuff and, um, you know, to hopefully get the, the food stamps again. And well, Homeless Resource Day is usually an annual event and it's a wonderful opportunity for the community of Montgomery County to get together service providers and nonprofit organizations to work with people who um, are homeless in our community. There were free haircuts and manicures and more than 65 organizations that offered a range of resources including free medical screenings, financial counseling, and social services. About 400 volunteers help attendees navigate all that there was to offer. There's other things like uh, food and clothing here. And it's just all together in one place. Something like this goes a long way for those in need throughout the county. It lets people who need resources know how, where they can receive the resources. And of course it involves many families and involves people who are, who are working but, but in many cases can't make ends meet. And this gives them the, the, the filling in the gap for what they need. It does affect people right in our community, and they're people that are just like me. They're one paycheck away 
from homelessness or maybe someone in their family got sick and they weren't able to pay their rent. So we think that it's a um, issue that's far removed from us, but it's, it's not. It's really here in our community affecting people that we probably know. It's not fun, no, and, um, but I'm glad, you know, that this service is available. Reporting in Gaithersburg, Jordan Lindsay for County Report this week. If you have donated to Heroes United thinking you were helping a volunteer firefighter department, you were the victim of deceptive telemarketing from a fictitious business, and the county's Office of Consumer Protection wants residents to know that you're due a reimbursement of your full donation. Turns out Heroes United is a political action committee doing business as Volunteer Firefighters Association collecting millions nationwide. Well, Consumer Protection has entered into a settlement agreement with the organization and scammed residents are to receive refunds. For more information, call the Office of Consumer Protection at 240-777-3636. Rockville's 66th mayor and council is officially sworn in in serving the city. Rockville 11's Craig Buchanan brings you their thoughts from Rockville's inauguration ceremony. After a historic and successful vote by mail election, the 66th Rockville mayor and council were sworn in on November 17th, 2019. For the next four years, we are fortunate to be represented by a pleasantly diverse group of intelligent, talented, dedicated, and compassionate individuals. Mayor Bridget Donald Newton is optimistic about her next four years of service. I think it's going to be um, a very great dynamic that the city hasn't seen in a long time with everybody having done their homework and bringing creative solutions forward. I'm really, really excited. Council members, both seasoned and new, also express enthusiasm about their roles in shaping Rockville's future. I am honored to serve, and today is a day of fresh beginnings and of coming together to collaborate to support this great city of Rockville. Today is another occasion to renew, become reinvigorated, and to do the people's work on behalf of the residents, businesses, and nonprofits that are in the city of Rockville. I'm very thankful for all the people in the community that put their trust in me. And I do hope to make everybody proud and working on behalf of all people here in Rockville. Well, it feels very good. I've been here before, and the two new members, Monique Ashton and David Miles, they bring a lot to the table, so I'm looking very much forward to that. With this new council beside me, I see a brand new ending for many of the opportunities on our incredible city's horizon. And friends, as we take this first step together, let us bring our best selves, our childlike acceptance, our open minds, and our willingness to see the possibilities, so that together we will serve the people who elected us as the 2019 City of Rockville Mayor and Council. Thank you. For County Report this week, I'm Craig Buchanan. The City of Gaithersburg's Winter Lights Festival is celebrating its 24th spectacular year. Crews started putting up the lights back in October at Great Seneca State Park. As you drive through a three and a half mile festival, you will discover lights strung high in the trees and on floating docks in the water. More than 450 illuminated displays that light up the night in themes areas include winter woods, Teddy Bear Land, Victorian Village, the North Pole, and more. The park is located on Clopper Road. For admission fees and hours of operation, visit GaithersburgMD.gov. And now it's time to meet our pet of the week. This week we want to introduce you to Bo, who is an excitable, goofy, five-year-old Mastiff mix with a heart as big as his head. He likes the company of other dogs and would be more than happy to have a plate made at his new forever home. He would be a great addition to any family with older children or adults. Bo would love to meet you and be part of your family. If you're interested in Bo, you can visit the shelter's website at montgomerycountymd.gov 
ASD to learn about the adoption process. And don't forget to follow Montgomery County Animal Services and Adoption Center on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at NCASAC. And with that, we close this edition of County Report this week. Remember, you can find more information about Montgomery County at montgomerycountymd.gov or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Join us again at this time every week for a look at what's going on inside Montgomery County. I'm Lorna Virgili, and thank you for watching. I'm pleased to welcome everyone to this Greater Washington Regional Meeting of our Commission to Study Mental and Behavioral Health in Maryland. I want to thank our host, Montgomery College, uh, for having us this evening, providing the space for us to do this and to talk about this uh, critically important issue. Um, I've, I've, as I've said before, the, the subject of this commission that we'll be discussing and continue to discuss over the next several months and, and actually years. It's not always an easy topic to discuss, but this represents something that the, I should say, an opportunity for us to make a real difference in people's lives and to truly change and reform the way we deliver services to some of our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, it's, it, I like to say it's far past due that we take a serious look at how we deliver mental health services. Um, as I say, when I say how we deliver, I also include the, the federal system as well, not just our, our state. And it's something that I feel very strongly about and an issue that is close to my heart. Over the last four or five years, four and a half years since um, the governor and I have been in office, We've been working to address the state's opioid issue. And I'd say I came to understand, many of you probably already knew, understand the relationship between the disease of addiction and, and mental illness. Um, previously, I looked at these conditions as separate and distinct. And I've learned, and as you all, many of you already know, that substance use disorder and mental illness are often co-occurring. And for some people, it may have been a situation where people were self-medicating, uh, where they had undiagnosed mental illness. And so we want to make sure that we, you know, address these issues because they do not just affect the individual who is suffering, but also the families and their communities as well, as well as their friends, I should say, too. So we want to take a fresh and serious look at how the state and, and the country, for that matter, uh, bring care to individuals and families. And to that end, the administration committed, created this commission, and the governor asked me to chair it. Uh, it was through an executive order earlier this year, and our goal is to identify ways to improve the services that affect many Marylanders uh, that are suffering from mental illness and co-occurring conditions. And we're doing that by engaging families, advocates, practitioners, and those on the front lines of this issue. Uh, I want to thank you for doing this, and I think this is a very important commission. Um, I'll say I wish you had the abilities of the Kerwin Commission, because Kerwin is dealing with two sides of this problem, which is, A, what are the programs we need to move our children forward, and how are we going to pay for it? And the part that we need to confront, because I think we all know pretty much what we need to do. I think you all map out. The Ag Advisory Committee is very appreciative of the growing support this delegation has demonstrated over the years to combat against the growing deer population. The proposed bill will allow hunters to use rifles while hunting under a deer management permit authorized by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Our county farmers continue to experience increasing crop damage from the growing deer population, and this negatively impacts the farmer's profitability. 
As deer continue to thrive throughout Montgomery County, we must continue to identify ways to manage the growing deer population. Total deer harvested each year continues to decline in population to the decreasing to the decreasing number of licensed hunters. Considering these trends, we need to make sure the remaining licensed hunters have the most effective means and tools to reduce the deer population. The Agriculture Advisory Committee thanks the sponsors of Bill MC620, Delicate Lucy, Kaiser, Quee, and Resnick for their support to the ag community. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as, as as many of you know, I, I have um, been active in, in helping pass legislation on this issue, Sunday morning hunting. Um, on this particular issue, I have been reached out to by constituents, and I also share some of the concerns in the ag reserve of discharging a high-powered rifle, which is completely different than discharging a shotgun with, let's say, a Sabo slug or something like that that's traveling uh, at a much slower um, feet per second, let's say, you're talking about 1,000 or 1,200 feet per second or even 800 feet per second up to 25, 27 or even 3,000 feet per second. And those rounds go very, very far. So I would, um, I mean, I'm open to have this conversation, but I would like to hear from the farmers and from others, this is Montgomery County and these are high-powered rifles. So I'd like to hear about backstops. I'd like to hear about what you're going to, what, what the plan is. Sure. And I, you know, other, and we can talk about it offline as well. Yeah, and other folks can respond as well. Um, but I, you know, I just want to point a couple of things out. Um, first of all, the the um, uh, farmers who would be authorized to do this um, are under a deer management permit. If there's unsafe hunting happening on their property, they're in danger of losing that permit. Um, and whoever's doing the hunting, in many cases it's the farmers themselves, is in danger of losing their hunting license. Mm -hmm. right? um, on, on top of that, you know, the, as uh, uh, maybe Doug mentioned, somebody down here mentioned, you know, this hunting is taking place um, uh, from elevated tree stands, right? You're from an elevated position. Um, you're shooting in a direction that would carry the bullet into the ground. Um, so, you know, these are not being fired willy-nilly. Um, so, I, you know, I understand that people are, uh, have questions, but I think ultimately this is um, a, a very safe uh, alternative. Uh, I appreciate your concern about safety. Um, I would like to point out that the topography of most of the ag reserve is such that if you're not hunting as a in, in a, out of a tree stand, as a good deer hunter, I'm a deer hunter, and um, as a good hunter and uh, somebody who uses a firearm responsibly, if I'm going to shoot a deer, I'm going to make sure that there's a background, like there's a hill, a that I, a backstop, backstop, so that anything that I discharge is not going to just go forever. It is going to go into the ground or safely so that um, I can be safe for myself and anyone else hunting on our farm. One final thought in terms of safety. I think the, the folks that would be, you know, the, the farmers that have these permits, they have families on their farms, right? They don't want people on their farms to be hunting in an unsafe manner because they've got kids, you know, um, and employees and themselves. So, you know, I, I think given how limited this program would be, um, it, it will be a, a safe and I would also yeah. advocate, because coming in from a farmer, we, you know, we get to pick and choose who are on these permits that are with us. And I, you know, I appreciate your, you know, your, your words of concern because you know it's a valid point, and so forth. But I think that, uh, you know, obviously, from the testimony, the status quo of what this deer population is doing to our uh, economic viability, it, you know, we need to we need to streamline us away. To, to mitigate that and you know I guess with that said you know being very cautious on whom we allow to be on those permits on our properties and the farms that we rent uh, can, can garner a, a great deal of attention right and and I mean you know where I live so yeah <laughs> believe me I, yeah. I'm I'm uh, uh, 
Does it specify, Delegate Luke, maybe this is for you, um, does it specify in the bill or do you have a, an issue with it specifying in the bill that it's from an elevated position? It does not specify. I would take the point of view that that would be unnecessarily restrictive. I, I would agree with that because I wouldn't hunt out of a tree stand. I'm not going to climb a tree, honestly. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, but I would like to point out that these deer management permits are not going to be used by every hunter in Montgomery County. Only the farms, as um, Delegate Lukey had pointed out, only farms that have shown um, and justified that they have crop damage. I have a question. Um, what calibers are you talking about using here? Because I didn't think you could use anything over 25 caliber. And, and sorry. So we're talking 25 caliber and under, right? We're, we're going to hold. Because you're allowed to, you're sorry, allowed to shoot gonna, groundhogs and coyotes with. Sorry, unless caliber. you're responding to the question, we're going to hold questions I, I am, from the I panel. Am, I, I, okay. I am responding. And okay. what I'm saying is, is that you're already allowed to use 243s, 25 odd sixes for shooting groundhogs and coyotes. So it's not like. You're, you're not it's not like it's something new we're really bring it's not like you're not allowed to hunt with those weapons already it's just we're not allowed to hunt deer with those weapons right so what, what I would say is I, I'm happy to to have a much longer conversation about this offline I will say that one of the calibers that you're talking about is a two two three or five five six and that travel can travel thirty two hundred feet per second I mean that's that's right that that round will go well over a thousand yards what even, we're even though it's less than twenty five but right. we, we could talk about it offline. Right. Talk, I'm happy to talk about it. Senator Kramer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick follow-up question because uh, maybe I misunderstood. I heard the question from the good delegate about the safety concerns. The response seemed to be from each and every one who did respond that this would be shooting from an elevated position, and therefore there's a backstop, the earth, should that bullet travel beyond the, uh, the the target and then when he inquired as to is it specified in the bill that it could only be fired from an elevated position the response is oh no i'm not going to be doing that it's I'm, I'm going to be doing it i assume either stalking ground level so can you explain to me the, the distinction there, or what did I miss? Uh, so the testimony was that in many cases people are shooting from an elevated position like a deer stand, but there are farmers who don't. And in those cases, the testimony was that uh, hunters will try to make sure that there's a, a backstop, a hill or something um, behind where they're shooting. Okay. So then, just to be clear, this may or may not be from an elevated position, it will be each individual choosing their position to get fire from, and that may or may not include a backstop, it may or may not be from an elevated position. So I, I guess the concerns that I heard uh, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo bring up maybe are, you know, legitimate in that a bullet like that, I'm assuming, can travel a couple of miles distance. So I, you know, I get the problem. Yeah, the deer are a huge problem, but the public welfare and public Senator, safety I, pieces also, which is why historically, I'm Senator, assuming, I'm not sure where the question is in here, but one of our witnesses would like to respond if you'd stop talking. Um, you know what? You had your opportunity to talk all you wanted, good delegate. I will talk all that I choose to talk. Are we clear on that? Colleagues, let's have the, the um, panelists respond, please. If I could please clarify. Please do. Um, what, and it is very possible to discharge, discharge a firearm from an elevated position, and the example would be, if I am here on a knoll, on a hill, that's an elevated position. And if you are shooting down in a ravine, we have many ravines in the agricultural reserve, particularly on our farm. So I would be elevated shooting down that way. And that is an example of discharging, discharging a firearm from an elevated position that's not in a tree. It is not necessary to restrict someone um, and, and say that they have to hunt out of a tree because it is possible to to hunt from an area where you are elevated and shooting down into an area. And that may well be, and I'm looking at the bill right now, I don't see where it makes a distinction shooting from an elevated position. It does not state that, at least as I see in the bill. So hence, 
the question from the delegate about concerns with the, the carry of a bullet, which, again, historically has not been permitted in Montgomery County because of public safety concerns. So I appreciate your uh, candid response, and thank you for that. Thank you so much, Delegate Barve. Thank you. Um, Delegate, um, a question for the sponsor. So clarify for me under what circumstances rifles can currently be used in the ag, uh, ag preserve, or if somebody else has a, a answer for that, I'd be happy to hear I, that. I, I, I think I'm not the best person sure, to respond okay. to that question. Varmints or target hunting, which, you know, coyotes, groundhogs, stuff like that, you are allowed to ch I'm a lawyer. I'm not the game warden, just but tell me, just you tell can me discharge how... a 25 caliber under weapon in this county. Un under my, am I correct on that? Please. I mean, it, unless they've changed the laws, that was my understanding. Mm -hmm. And target shooting. So there are ranges, outdoor ranges in different parts of the county. So they're already shooting at animals and uh, with these same weapons. Okay. Thank you. Elliot Kaiser. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all today. And thank you, Paula. I thought it was very clear when you first said that there was a backdrop that you were referring to the land behind it. Uh, so thank you. That was incredibly clear. Uh, the question I had, and I was going to ask what Delegate Barve asked, so I'm glad that that was asked. I also just want to ask, not every farmer can get this. Uh, it's a pretty uh, difficult requirement to first go to DNR and demonstrate the crop damage. So what, what does that part entail, the, the demonstration of the, uh, the, the challenge to their farm? To answer. Um, they come out, they send a representative out, and they inspect the damage. Um, you know, I, they have a formula for doing it, and I'm not privy to that, but they come out and they inspect the damage and they uh, issue permits accordingly. And the permits, it, this is a process that the farmer needs to go through every year. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, this concludes the hearing on MC 620. We will start the hearing on MC 720, Montgomery County Agricultural Land Transfer Tax, requested by Delegate Lukey as well. And um, we'll keep up there, John Fendrick, Doug Leckler, sorry, and Michael Jameson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so uh, MC 720 is a bit of a loophole closer bill. Um, this has to do with the funding of our agricultural land preservation programs. If you're unfamiliar, um, what has allowed Montgomery County and many parts of the state of Maryland to preserve viable agriculture in the state is the historic investments that the state has made in agricultural land preservation programs. Um, much of what they do is purchase easements that, that limit development and permanently preserve land for agricultural purposes. Um, unfortunately, um, because of some changes in the economy and in how we tax and in how uh, people pay taxes, uh, the agricultural land preservation funds statewide and, and in Montgomery County um, have become less than sufficient to do what they need to do. Um, and part of that has to do with a tax loophole. Now, we closed, partially closed that tax loophole in the state agricultural land transfer tax through legislation that passed in the 2019 legislative session. That uh, loophole allowed people to avoid paying the agricultural land transfer tax entirely if they paid property tax for a certain number of years as if the land were residential or another use rather than agricultural. Um, this was used, for example, to avoid uh, in one project in the Ag Reserve multiple millions of dollars of payments in agricultural land transfer taxes by a large uh, multinational corporation. Um, and so uh, we close that at the state level, but there is also a county agricultural land transfer tax. Uh, separate from over and above the state agricultural land transfer tax. This legislation is intended to close the same loophole with the county tax and secondarily to dedicate uh, officially all revenues from the agricultural land transfer tax to agricultural land preservation, um, which has not been dedicated funding previously. Um, and uh, I should add as a caveat, um, there is a, a drafting error that is mea culpa, my fault, in the bill that actually goes beyond uh, what was intended and, and uh, would have an uh, unintended effect of actually decreasing some funds from certain people. Um, so that's being fixed through an amendment that the county is working on. It's my understanding that with that amendment, both the county executive and the county council are supportive of this legislation. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. 
Uh, good evening. Um, on behalf of the Montgomery County Agricultural Preservation Advisory Board, I want to thank you for your efforts in helping the, the agricultural community. For the past five years, um, our, my board has pursued multiple sources of funding for ag agricultural preservation. Essentially, the bottom line is, as there's less farmland turned into development, there's less money to preserve. And so we're trying to find ways to preserve farmland um, when the major sources of revenue is dried up. So we've been, we've been looking around for several years trying to figure out uh, different ways. Um, so you, you may have heard some of us come to you, and at, at times you'll probably hear us continue to come in front of you because we, you know, the whole purpose of my board is to preserve land. And I mean, that's what we want to do. We, we want to try to preserve at the highest or lowest density possible to make the, the largest tracts possible preserved and not have little, I mean, what sounded like, so this isn't in the testimony, but what sounded like really good 30 years ago was 25 acre lots. Well, what do you have now? You now have these big houses in Potomac with 25 acre lots that are just a big house and a land that's, that's landscaped. It's not, it's not agriculturally viable, uh, but a 75, 100 acre property is viable with one house on it. So Dele Delegate Lukey and his staff have worked with my board to find means to help fund agriculture preservation for Montgomery County. In the previous legislative session, as he talked about, he introduced and helped pass HB 20, which closed the loophole at the state level. Um, the board supports the intent of Montgomery County 720. It will direct the collection of county agriculture transfer tax to be used to purchase easements or other programs to support agriculture. We are aware that, as he mentioned, the county executive supports, supports the bill with amendments addressing the offset language and that he finds the amendments to be friendly. We'd like to thank the sponsor of the bill, Delegates Lutke and Resnick, for the support of agriculture preservation in Montgomery County and look forward to getting the bill passed. Thank you. Good evening again, Michael Jameson, farmer of Montgomery County. On behalf of the Montgomery Agriculture Producers, please accept this testimony in favor of Delegate Eric Lukey's uh, Montgomery County Bill, MC 720. The agricultural community has long advocated for this transfer tax to be used for the purpose of agricultural preservation. Our preservation programs have long been one of the driving forces that have protected this reserve by removing the development rights and protecting the land for the purpose of perpetuating agriculture for the future generations uh, in this county. The traditional funding from the state land transfer tax has become a non-sustainable source. The preservation funds needed to keep these programs alive depend on our leadership to make decisions on continuing to fund these programs. Directing our county ag transfer funds to these programs is a great start. We ask for favorable support for this bill and we thank the sponsors of it. Thank you very much. Good evening again. On behalf of Montgomery County Agriculture Advisory Committee, we thank the delegation members for this opportunity to present testimony in support of MC 720 with amendments. Montgomery County is proud of our nationally recognized agricultural reserve, including the 558 farmers that continue to earn a living farming that land. Montgomery County is currently ranked in the nation, uh, ranked third in the nation for total acres of farmland protected by agricultural easements. This achievement demonstrates the commitment that our farmers have made to ensure that farmland is available for future food and fiber production for many generations to come. There are many farmers in the county that are interested in farmland preservation, but unfortunately, the sources of funding to purchase agriculture easements is very limited. The Agriculture Advisory Committee thanks Delegate Lukey and Resnick for sponsoring MC 720 that will redirect county agriculture transfer taxes to fund agriculture easements and agricultural programs. While the Agriculture Advisory Committee supports the primary purpose of MC 720 to redirect the county agriculture transfer taxes for farmland preservation, we understand the county executive and county council support the bill with amendments that delete the language relating to offsets. The Agriculture Advisory Committee agrees with Delegate Lukey that these are friendly amendments and they will not negatively impact the bill. The Agriculture Advisory Committee thanks the sponsors of MC 720, Delegates Lukey and Resnick, for their continued support to assist the agriculture community in Montgomery County. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And sir, to make sure we have it for the record, can you please state your name? Thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you so much. That concludes the hearing on MC 720. We will now move forward with MC 1620, Montgomery County Country Clubs and Golf Courses. Good evening, colleagues. Um, I apologize you're here back so quickly on this same bill, um, so it may be familiar to you. This is a little bit more of a status update than a hearing in truth, uh, so we're sparing you from a relitigation of the details of this issue tonight. Um, the bill as introduced is actually just the amended version that we voted on earlier this year. And we are currently in discussions with some of the clubs to see if it is possible that we can get on the same page on this issue. These um, tax assessments haven't been looked at in, I think, 17 years. And obviously, the land and land values have changed quite a bit. So knock on wood, I'm hopeful um, something positive might come out from that. So stay tuned. Thank you, Delegate. Any questions? All right. Um, Thank you so much. The opposition testimony is written only, so that concludes the hearing on MC 1620. We will move forward with the hearing on MC 2020, Montgomery County Residential Property Advertisements and Sales. All right, I saved all the fun for this one. Um, MC 2020, uh, this is a bill that deals with school boundaries and home sales in Montgomery County. Um, I will have you know, my dad is a realtor, a uh, longtime realtor, and I had a feeling this was going to be cause for some interesting Thanksgiving conversations. It was. So while all of you are talking about impeachment over Turkey, we were talking school boundaries and real estate transfers um, at my table. So um, let me just tell you, uh, the bill is going to change. This is, uh, um, this is definitely one that I think goes, if, if we work on it, it's going to go into work session. Um, but let me tell you what it was trying to do. You know, divorce yourself a bit from the school boundary discussion that's going on that triggered this and just look at exactly what it's trying to do. There are two um, prongs to the bill as introduced. One is an attempt to get at this issue of steering under the Federal Fair Housing Act. And I put a little bit of information um, on your table about what that is, but it's, it's – um, a way in which the feds have tried to stop uh, steering people away from certain neighborhoods and homes. And you see it in, for example, how realtors won't talk about crime rates or demography um, and things like that. And that's stuff that if you've gone through this process is familiar. Um, but there is an aspect of this that relates to discussions of schools. And so I've included some discussion of this from the National Association of Realtors talking about how realtors' conversations about schools and school boundaries can implicate Fair Housing Act problems and also internal uh, realtor ethics issues. Um, so needless to say, an example of this might be if you have a realtor talking about how great the schools are in one area and saying nothing about them somewhere else. And I, in fact, had a uh, realtor in my district see this bill and start pulling some numbers, that, which I've included for you here, just as a sample going into the MRIS system and looking at what is being said about uh, homes for sale in Montgomery County. And for example, um, she found 112 listings talking about Walt Whitman High School, excuse me, 112 schools, um, homes with Walt Whitman as the school district. Um, 40 of them mentioned the specific school. If you skip over to Gaithersburg at that same time period, zero of them even mention what school uh, was assigned to that home. Um, Einstein, 27 active listings. One of them mentioned the name of an elementary school and nothing else. And so the reason why this bill is structured in this specific way, it deals only with licensed realtors, not for sale by owner, not rentals, things that have a standard form. 
standard software that everybody is using, and so it is easy to try and fix some of these systems where you have, say, a Long and Foster realtor who is only talking about schools when they're in the W's and mentioning nothing about them when they're not and potentially raising Fair Housing Act issues. Because the Fair Housing Act issues are complaint driven, it relies on someone to file a complaint for this to actually take life, for that law to take life. But because the victim here is nebulous, it is the community at large in the school district that for which realtors don't want to mention the school, you are unlikely to see that type of a claimant step forward to seek relief. And so it must be done through pressuring a change to the software or other internal practices of GCAR. The enforcement language in here comes from existing enforcement language. The definition of advertising comes from federal and state language. None of this is new. And so I know it's been said that this is a discussion of free speech issues Real estate commercial speech is already heavily regulated in exactly the manner I've described. And the realtors themselves uh, seem to believe that this type of macro steering happening by way of real estate listings is problematic. So the good news is I introduced this topic to the realtors who unfortunately found out about this bill through the press. Um, we had some nice conversations uh, since then, and they are taking a look at what changes are possible in the MRIS backend software that they use and to see if things are possible potentially without legislation. I don't know. That's um, ongoing, but it, it seems that is one path. Now, the second part of the bill deals with uh, what's going on on the buyer's end of this equation. So that, that other part we were talking about is really about what the realtors are doing. And so the second part is getting at um, buyer surprise, which is the second goal. The first goal of the bill is steering. The second is buyer surprise. And if you're following anything about what's going on with the school boundary discussion in Montgomery County, you're hearing a lot about potentially home values being impacted, um, exactly this notion of buyer surprise. This is my attempt to get at it in a particular way. Um, I think about, you know, I used to be a political consultant how you guarantee as a candidate you're getting information on a one-to-one -one basis to a certain individual. And the closing documents and the addendum seem like probably the most direct way to do that. Um, on this one, I think there's some uh, hesitation from the realtors who believe there's already um, an extensive closing document process. I will note that I believe in almost a unanimous vote, this same body last or this year voted to add a septic system acknowledgments to these closing documents um, for what it's worth in terms of uh, the political and policy precedent. Um, and I'll just leave it at that for any questions, but say this is all in flux. Um, I think there's a lot of conversations to be had here. I think we'll have some interesting uh, work sessions, but I'd like to find a way for us to ease this process as the county undertakes some very difficult discussions that are already happening. Delegate Resonate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate Moon, just a, a quick question. I get sort of the immediacy of going to the MRIS system and then seeing a school listed right there along with all the other information on a house. But if you really cared that much, couldn't you simply open the MCPS website, stick the address in, and your schools will pop up for that address right there? You could do that with crime rates right now, too. Um, but there was a public policy decision to, ta to detach that aspect of uh, crime, say, and demography, um, whether you have kids, things of that nature, from the, our role in licensing these professionals to be able to go and sell people houses without making characterizations or comments on the neighborhood that, at, again, at a macro level, because it doesn't work if you just look at it one to one, one, but when you look at the numbers stacked up, it's a pretty... I think it's a pretty glaring picture of what's going on. There are plenty of ways you could deal with this. And, you know, I've looked, read some of the online commentary. You haven't solved the school boundary dispute here. Correct. I'm just trying to find some paths for us to increase um, public education about how exactly these school boundaries are constructed and to relieve buyer surprise. Um, again, I'm open to other ways of doing it. This is just, I saw Howard. County began to tackle this, took a look at some of their ideas, tried to adapt them to what was going on here, and now I'm listening to the realtors to see 
okay, maybe we actually could just solve this through the software. And then the benefit of that is we're not even relying on a complaint-driven process. Like, for example, um, sh shouldn't the system prompt a realtor to say what the school is in uh, if there's a home being purchased? You know, right now what's happening is it's not a required field. So if it's Whitman, they're all saying it's Whitman. And if it's Einstein, they're not saying it's anything at all. You know, again, just a software change prompting that. Yes, does that get into compelled speech and commercial speech restrictions territory? Potentially. But in the realm of housing, we've already done it. And I could point to many other um, instances, because I, I looked at different instances of the Maryland Code regulating commercial speech, realtor speech in particular, um, plus the omission of information in advertising that is deemed material. And if you're advertising that a home comes with a school, I certainly think it's material that that school may not come with the home. Barbe. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. S uh, okay, so how many how many different instances how many different instances are there where the real estate uh, uh, professionals are disallowed from mentioning, you know, publicly available facts? You're saying crime rates. What else? Well, it's not quite. It doesn't say you can't discuss crime rates. Say it's a, it's about protected categories, right? Race. But over time, this has been interpreted that certain things you do are basically code words for that. And well, what, so, well, what does the law currently say with respect to crime? Uh, it, it's not going to be in the code, I don't okay. believe. It's going to be uh, from decisions. But the code is, is in reference to not having uh, steering housing discrimination happening on a protected class like race. But say crime rates are avoided because of the potential for coded language to steer people in and out of neighborhoods based on that, if it becomes a proxy for it. Okay, so you're basically saying that it's not, not in... Me. No, no, no. Yeah. You're, you're <laughs> asserting yep. that it's not in the code. It's as a result of legal decisions. So it's statewide. Well, that's now, yeah. If, with I mean, respect you, to you crime will already rates. find realtors hesitating to discuss crime rates. Okay. That's, yeah, that's currently the case. Okay. So let me let's get to the direct issue associated with school districts. So you acknowledge that these are all public. This is all publicly available information that we're going to dis disallow, and and so for example, when I was selling my mom's house in Bethesda, I'm sure they mentioned that it was. Whitman High School. I'm sure they must have. I, I don't remember personally. And I'm sure it helped me get a good price for her house, which was important because I needed that money for her, you know, to ta help take care of her t toward the end of her life. And so, so you would prefer to disallow this altogether? Well, it depends how you go about it. I mean, you could look at it the other way, which is that everyone should list what school, but that's a little funky for a bill to say what the MRI system must li I mean, you could do it that way. Um, well, but, this is, but this is why but I'm not bill, just talking your, to them directly to see what's actually possible here uh, with the system. Okay, but you I know. mean, the bill that you've presented to yeah. us just <clears throat> literally says that uh, It says you can real include the information in listings. And the problem is this was trying to get it the way the MRIS is constructed. You have standard listing information. What's the school district? What is the annual tax? What is the facts? And then you have optional fields where you can put in characterization. Great schools, well sought after by everyone, Whitman neighborhood. OK. OK, uh, maybe. So what part um, of that do you want to get rid of, the whole thing or just the Whitman neighborhood part? <laughs> the bill was trying to get at the, par the part of the MRIS system where you would be prompted to put in factual information okay. and allow it to go there, but where you are characterizing the schools to not do that. Now, again, uh, you know, that's not necessarily the only model. That's how the bill as introduced was drafted, okay. to try and go in that direction. So if you look at it, it actually doesn't say you can't say the school. It says, if effectively, you can say the school. It's trying to limit other circum advertising it. This house comes with the Whitman School District. Well, I mean, your bill says I mean, that's may false not. advertising, well, I would actually argue. Well, your bill says may not include the name of the school district in which the residential property is located. So, in and effect, then look at the paragraph after it. Okay. 
It's talking about advertising in the first instance and the MRIS listing in the second instance. Okay. Now, whether that's clear and how it's written, we can we can talk about. But that's that's the that's the attempted effect of the bill, that it allows a factual description of the school. But when you're advertising that a home comes with a school, I think you have a problem with. I tend to think that's a false advertising problem or an advertising by omission. The other approach, and I didn't want to drown you with amendments, I did draft an amendment that would go in the other direction and say, all right, you can mention the school, but you have to put something on there that says, this does not guarantee that you're going to get that school by just by purchasing this house. This can change. Okay, but why would it be false advertising if at the moment of sale it's in a particular school district? Why, why would that be false advertising? Again, this is all depends on how you how you perceive this issue. From where I sit, you may disagree, but if a realtor is telling me that this house comes with, I guess it depends on how old my kids are, right? If the realtor knows I have a one-year-old, you know, then you could sort of game out, you know, the likelihood of Whitman being the school district. Where am I on the school boundary line? Am I on the edge of the Whitman school district and I have a one-year-old and the realtor knows that, you know? 12, 13 years from now, I'm on the edge of the Whitman School District. I might not be there. I don't know. I mean, again, you, we can disagree on just where uh, the line should be. I tend to think a bright line for these types of serious transactions that people are stuck stuck with for years, it's, it's easier. And again, as you noted, they can look this information up themselves and, in fact, do. You know, the realtor's not going to tell you the crime information. You might look it up. My sister was looking for a place, and she was going and finding all the sex offenders, you know, in the uh, area on her on her thing. That was not something Zillow provided her. Uh, just one last question. So this is this would be a, a first of its kind, but it, doesn't the Howard County delegation have something similar to this that they're considering? They, yes, um, and they split theirs up over multiple bills. I, I see. Tried to spare you that misery and put it all in one. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Thank you, Delegate Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Moon. I do appreciate the intent of your bill. Um, I, I really do. I, um, I'm just thinking of the practical implications. I've bought four houses in the last 15 years. I've signed a lot of things in the sign in the closing. You know, uh, people often, you know, when you're doing the closing, they say this is a ridiculous thing. You're required to sign by law, and you sign it, and you don't read it. You know, and, and that's what the closings are like. Um, having done four in the last several years. But also, as I was buying those houses, I was for really practical reasons looking for places in certain school districts, right? I got divorced and I needed to be near my ex-husband, had to be in the same school district. Um, I repartnered up, had to be in the same school district. Um, these are practical. I even moved out of Whitman District but needed to be in Legislative District 16. I purposely, actually it wasn't my choice, it was May's choice, purposely did not want to be at Whitman because it wasn't diverse enough and we wanted to be in WJ. And so we're only searching for houses in these certain school districts and really depending on that feature. Now I know one of the websites we were using at that time had a searchable function where you could just check which school district you were looking for. As a busy person, this was really important to me and my life and I would hate for consumers not to have that opportunity. Um, because our real lives depend on us being able to look within certain geographic areas related to our children's lives in their schools. We don't want to change schools if we don't have to. Uh, one, when my son with autism was having a lot of trouble um, uh, finding the right school, someone said, this is the principle that you need to be in her school. This is the right school district for your kid with autism. And when I moved into that school district, suddenly my kid with autism is you know, thriving after five years there. So, so, so we need these, these, this flexibility. And it's not a speech, it's so much as a, I like when you say maybe we can transform this to a bill where everyone's listing what school district. More and it's just you know, more it information rather than less. I really mm -hmm. like that and I encourage you to work on that. Um, and just also thinking about the last house that I bought, it came with this really expensive Sub-Zero wine fridge. It was listed on the little thing, and it sure was there when I moved in. A week after I moved in, it was broken, and those things cost 1200 bucks to fix. So now it has a Sub-Zero dog treat holder, you know, <laughs> because it, I'm never going to repair that. My point being that I think we're used to things being listed in our housing descriptions that are not necessarily guaranteed forever. Um, so that was a lot of words with not a lot of questions, so much as I hope that as we approach these conversations and we look at this bill, we think about real people's real lives, because I think a lot of us are looking for housing in certain school districts um, 
for a whole bunch of different reasons, and I would not want to take that flexibility away from people. Yep. And, and just to be clear, the bill, even as introduced, would actually provide you plenty of opportunity to know what the schools were. Well, but I do want to, yeah. you know, <laughs> there's a difference between, like you were saying, with your sister looking for sex offenders. I look for sex offenders, too, but I do that after I've found the house I want, right? You need to come up with your right. list of houses to go visit and then go visit them, and you don't want to waste your time looking for one in the wrong school district if it's not going to meet your family's needs. Thank you. Delegate Dumay. <laughs> House Judiciary Committee, and I'm going to ask the question that Chairman Valeria would ask. What problem does this solve? And maybe you can start with what problem existed that brought this to you? I mean, for what it is worth, I have done some searching recently for reasons that nobody needs to know, um, for houses for someone. And I've not looked at one MRS, MRIS, listing that didn't list all of the schools. So I guess, what problem is this trying to address? What, how did you get here? Yeah. And if then, how does it solve it, which I think you've already said, we may need to work on it. And what are the unintended consequences? Well, I would say none, but um, uh, <laughs> okay. I don't intend any. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to go back to where I started. The bill has two goals. One is to reduce the element of buyer surprise or self-reported buyer surprise, if you want to phrase it that way, um, that to the extent you pay attention to what people are saying in the school boundary debates, in the comment sections of papers, listen in, into the hearings, you will hear it frequently repeated that people believe their house comes with a school. Now. I'm not going to argue on whether they should or should not want that. They should choose a uh, house for that reason. It's fine. Everyone can do as they please. But from where we sit, and again, we have a multi-billion dollar construction backlog um, and other things we need to pay for, I mean, there's a real question. We have empty seats, and we have uh, overstuffed schools. And so before we get to funding the billions in Kerwin, um, that we're going to need to do, we're eventually going to have this CIP funding question in front of us too. Um, what does it mean when we have a school construction backlog, some percentage of which can be attributed to empty seats that we're not using? So that's part of where, you know, this whole being in a balanced budget state, believe it or not, has made this hippie a fiscal conservative and a deficit hawk. Um, and when I look at what's going on with school system over and under capacity schools, it raises this question about is this the best um, use of our resources, finite resources. The county is undergoing this discussion right now, and a lot of people are saying, you can't do anything. My home, my home values, I thought this was going to happen. I thought X and Y was going to happen. Won't anyone think of this? Um, and again, this bill is not going to solve that issue, to be sure. So that is fair to Chairman Valerio's uh, legacy, but I think from where I sit, it helps address the other issue, which is we tried through this process to let people know, and we made every effort to divorce home sales and school boundaries from this notion of property values being a, uh, a policy priority that we should put into the top of our basket. I personally don't think property values are how school boundaries should be drawn. I understand that that is a concern that we have to factor in. That's my personal preference, but I would think everyone would be better served if it was very clear to them that these school boundaries could change. Like I said, I'm, I'm open to talk. Yeah, I'm open to talk. Okay. Thank you, Delegate Lukey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate, I think you're underselling this bill. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you a series of questions because I, I think that this is the most important bill we're hearing tonight, including my own. And it's the first entree that the delegations had into this school-related discussion. Um, 1968, the Fair Housing Act passed. And among other things, it banned steering, racial steering by real estate agents, right? Is that correct? Correct. 
Um, so essentially, a real estate agent can't say, live in this neighborhood because it's a white neighborhood anymore. That's illegal. Correct. Right. But they can say, hey, this, this, this neighborhood has great schools. You should live there, right? Correct. Except our schools are extremely segregated. Isn't that right? Some would say. And part of the reason for that, according to a lot of the best social science research out there, is because of these choices that are being made, influenced intentionally or unintentionally uh, by realtors who are just trying to sell a house, and influenced by individual decisions by individual homeowners. But uh, the end result is that we're in a society that for the last 40, 50 years has been sorting itself by, among other things, race. Is that fair? Uh, I would agree with that. OK. And one of the ways this is one of the more insipid ways this is happening is that in a lot of the real estate advertising that's out there, not necessarily by realtors, but by other companies that are trying to um, provide quote unquote information to consumers, use these simplistic standards of judging the qualities of schools that have been highly correlated with the race and socioeconomics of the children in that schools. Are you familiar with that? Yep. Okay. So what ends up happening is a situation like exists in my district where you can be at an elementary school which is 99% minority and go a couple blocks away and be at an elementary school that's 99% white. And those schools have incredible disparities in terms of the PTAs and how much money they're able to raise and community involvement, all of those issues. Is that right? Yep. So this bill's a lot about a lot more than just consumer information. It's about the promise that we made in 1954 to desegregate our schools and the fact that we've been falling backwards on that promise, whether intentionally or not, it's about trying to make sure that all our kids have equal access to opportunity. Would that be fair? That would be very fair. Thank you. Any other questions for Delegate Moon? All right, we are going to call up um, a support panel, Nate Tinbite. Dan Reed, Sunil Dasgupta, Hanna Oluni, Laura Stewart, Jill Ortman Faust, and Michael Solomon. We can start, anyone. Good evening, Montgomery County delegates and fellow community members. My name is Hana Oluni, and I am a sophomore at Richard Montgomery High School. I am very pleased with Delegate Moon's introduction of MC 2020, a bill that despite harsh criticism would eliminate room for misconception on the relationship between housing and public school assignments. Today, as a student advocate and someone who cares deeply about the education received by my peers, I would like to reiterate the importance of this bill. MC 2020 sets a precedent for fighting against a system that is rooted in inequity. Whether or not Montgomery County Public Schools boundary analysis results in redistricting, the reality of our school system is that school boundaries are always subject to change. As the population increases and new schools are being built, students will have to be shifted around and student boundaries are bound to change. MC 2020 merely clarifies this fact. There are families who fear that this bill will educationally or financially shortchange them. However, this is not the case. In the long term, school assignments are never guaranteed in a public school system. And when realtors advertise their homes as being part of one district or another, it only serves to further the false narratives on what the good schools and bad schools are in Montgomery County. MC 2020 has nothing to do with busing students. That's an issue handled by MCPS. MC 2020 has to do with the big banner I pass by on the bus to school every morning, advertising a new apartment complex as, quote, in the Wooten High School District, a W school. Not only do banners like these advertise something that cannot be guaranteed with the addition of two new MCPS high schools in the near future, but they also continue to force the misconception onto newcomers in our communities that there is a hierarchy of schools in Montgomery County. Thank you. You can start. Okay. 
Good evening. My name is Laura Stewart, and I am speaking as a Silver Spring homeowner, a proud parent of an Einstein High School freshman, and education advocate, not on behalf of any PTA. I support Bill MC 2020, particularly the requirement to disclose that you are not guaranteed a certain school. It's been an interesting time to be an education advocate in Montgomery County. Disparities between demographic groups have been highlighted through the equity accountability model. The BOE has updated their policy to emphasize diversity when determining boundaries. School population continues to increase, and our capital budget has been underfunded for years, causing a backlog of $1.5 billion. Meanwhile, moratoriums on new housing development kicked in last year for several clusters. Because of the issues listed above, the Board of Education has approved a system-wide boundary analysis. Some of us have been advocating for a countywide look at boundaries because we believe that boundaries created 30 years ago might not make as much sense today. Others see this analysis as a direct threat to their investment and their kids' way of life. This bill focuses on the first perceived threat, and indirectly it could help bring communities together. It makes clear that when you buy a home, you are not buying a school, you are buying into the system. Signing such a document will help stop some of the us versus them mentality that has been rampant over the last year. If you are buying a house in a broader community, you will fight harder for all schools that live up to live up to reput the reputation of Montgomery County schools. We already see this in a down county consortium. We often advocate for schools outside our immediate cluster because our kids might choose one of the other schools. It has been disheartening to hear from some parents and online commentators that say that people choose to buy in bad schools, but they didn't work hard enough to get into the good schools on the west side of the county. I ask these parents, can we afford to continue to build additions, buy more portables, or build a new school when there is space three miles away? Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jill Ortman Faust, former member of the school board. I'm gonna throw a bunch of numbers at you. We have 10,000 students and over 400 portables that we spend about $5 million a year to lease. We have overcrowded elementary schools with lunch periods from 10.15 until 2 p.m. Hundreds of teachers on carts with no home rooms. Safety concerns, we have at our school facilities, you have to buzz in with a video camera. But for our portables, there's no barrier between intruders and students. And yet, we have 10,000 empty seats in other schools. We've had some of our most overcapacity schools next to multiple undercapacity schools, but we'll build a costly addition on the overcapacity school before we'll shift boundaries. We have an over $790 million backlog in system-wide repair needs, plumbing to roofing to everything else, and the majority is outdated HVAC. Ask any teacher what it's like to work in classrooms that are unbearably hot or freezing cold. So no money to spare. Schools over 150% capacity with as many as 14 portables, strained learning environments, safety issues, and a backlog of serious repair needs, while the other half of our schools are under capacity. Why have we not had regular boundary studies like other district reviews for like last 30 years? Because it's the political third rail. People here, where we have a tremendous wealth gap, believe they buy a school when they buy their house. And they have very clear ideas about what they believe are good schools. Recent research has looked at, from Stanford Research, thousands of school districts, districts throughout the country. And they found there is no school district where minority students disproportionately attend high poverty schools that does not have a large racial achievement gap, none. Separate is still unequal. People say, just make all our schools great. I've heard Thank it you. so many times. But we Thanks, have. Jill. Thank you. All right. Evening. My name is Dan Reed, and I'm a, my partner and I are homeowners in Silver Spring. My day job is as an urban planner, but for three years I've been a real estate licensee with Living in Star Real Estate in Burdensville, a very, very small family-owned company. I'm here in strong support of Delegate Moon's bill. As Delegate Ludke notes, Montgomery County's neighborhoods are often segregated by race and class, in part due to bigoted policies and mortgage lending and zoning that cordon off high opportunity areas from poor people and people of color, a legacy that persists today 
our schools reflect that segregation. And the result is that public schools that everybody pays for with their taxes have become a brand name. Viking Stove, Hardy Plank Siding, Walt Whitman High School. I graduated from James Hubert Blake High School. My brother graduated from Paint Branch. Both of those schools are majority non-white and majority farms. Both schools have excellent teachers, gorgeous buildings, and hardworking students. We are both, I'd like to think, functioning successful people. And yet, I don't see real estate ads for the schools I went to. People pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to avoid the schools that I went to because of perceptions about who goes there and what happens there. As a real estate agent, fair housing laws prevent me from steering my clients to certain neighborhoods based on the demographics. But we are free to do that based on schools. We are free to steer our clients based on schools. I'll show you an example. These two houses were built by Winchester Homes in Montgomery County in 1985. Both sold for $200,000, both of four bedrooms, three bathrooms, 2,500 square feet, and a quarter acre lot. The house on the left sold for $515,000 two years ago. It's in the Springbrook High School cluster. The home on the right sold for $765,000. It's in the Richard Montgomery cluster. I wonder which one had the name of the school in the real estate ad. It shouldn't be like that, and it should change. And that's why I urge you to support Delegate Moon's bill. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sunil Dasgupta. I am a um, parent of three kids in MCPS. I support MC 2020, its immediate and broader intent. School boundaries are not national borders, but rather administrative lines that should be changed periodically to reflect demographic and population changes. There's a view that Montgomery County changes the school boundaries often. That is incorrect. Montgomery County has not changed its school boundaries in any comprehensive manner since the 1980s, except when there is a new school opened. If you look at overcrowding, you see a distribution problem. In 2019, MCPS reported that 100 of its schools were overcrowded to the tune of 10,860 students. What goes unreported is that the other half of MCPS schools are under-enrolled by 9,357 seats. The countywide deficit is 1,500 if we could reassign students. However, if we can only do this, if school districting is a political, legal, and administrative possibility, based on the fact that MCPS has not undertaken countywide boundary review since the mid 80s, I would argue that the process of redistricting is too onerous, irrational, and driven by few loud vo voices. The general welfare of Montgomery County lies in a school redistricting process that is periodic, time lag for predictability, and possibly conducted by an independent and binding review commission. Such a process is fiscally responsible, will save on construction costs, morally upright, will enable equitable opportunity for the county's changing population, um, administratively necessary, help redistribute resources, you, and Sunil. pedagogically uh, desirable. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you all made it tough. Ooh. All right, um, any questions? Delegate Kelly. Sorry to keep going on, but um, as you guys were talking, I was really noting that the testimony was largely focusing on this, the written notice part. Um, and it occurred to me as the realtor was talking that it might be better if the written notice were in the contract with the realtor so that consumers were getting that information up front rather than at closing. So just a thought. Um, but my question was actually, I think to Jill, but anybody who has a, who really wants to answer this, I'm interested. To me, I'm still thinking that it might be a better approach if we had something nice to say about all of our schools. And would it be okay if we were to modify this in a way so that consumers could still see what school district, that, what the house they were looking at in, as it would, you know, it would be a nice sentence about Springbrook or it would be a nice sentence about RM or whatever, as opposed to just saying we can't say it ever. So, Jill? I, yeah, I think there's lots of nice things to say about our most of our schools. I, and if, I, I know there is. I right? meant if the realtors were doing that. <laughs> but, but I don't think they are. I mean, what, 
what parents do is they look at the scores of schools with the park scores and the SAT scores and they say this school is good because it has high scores so I, I, I would you know say that in Montgomery County our greatest resource is diversity so you would think our most expensive houses would be near our schools that are most reflective of our diversity but that's not true at all we have a growing segregation by race and income that has been documented by the Office of Legislative Oversight in Montgomery County Public Schools we have 36 schools that are less than 10 percent african-american and about 45 schools that are less than 10 percent white it doesn't make any sense um, when we've got a county uh, that has about a 35 percent farms rate um, that we shouldn't have any high poverty schools and yet we do, do. do you, I mean the part the part of this bill that just deals with the advertising mm -hmm. do you think that just not letting them say this is in the Whitman district is going to solve that problem or I, is going to make a difference I, there I think not promising a school I think that's what people believe that's what people we, we hear people say over and over again and I'll let Laura talk but they say I bought my house in this neighborhood because I get this school if you make my kids go to a different school then my home will lose value because that school's not as good or if you have those kids come to my school my school value will go down yeah I mean and that's definitely the larger problem I totally right. understand that and I do think we could put language in, in a, a contract or at the at the closing or something to clarify that but I'm really concerned about the advertising for the practical reasons I was talking about before there are legitimate reasons that have nothing to do with um, people trying to buy a house in a racially discriminatory way that make them want to be in a certain school district and I don't want to uh, encumber people as they're searching for houses so I think more information might be better could, but could I'm I, hearing you don't agree could I respond Please to that, that yeah. comment so you're proposing that we have a line that you're required to say something about every school we do have a system like that sort of right if you go to Zillow or Truly or Redfin they pull up the ratings from greatschools.org and so every house you look up in the county it tells you what the three schools that are assigned to it are and it gives them a, a rating right that is one that is one occasion in which there's information about every school on a, a real estate listing now the great schools rankings are really flawed because they often pull from test scores and demographics and even then they often are wildly wild discrepancies from one to the other so I I'm not I'm not sure that I feel good about that honestly I don't I kind of shudder to to watch an agent who works primarily in Potomac or Bethesda struggle to think of a good thing to say about Paint Branch High School for the one listing they get in Burtonsville. Like, I don't, I would rather they just not be allowed to talk about schools at all and for the buyers to do their own research. Or as I would do with my own buyers, say, these are the schools of the county list right now on the website. I urge you to do your own research and they're going to change. I, so I, I have a slightly different take on what you're saying. And Einstein High School, I constantly hear why aren't people learning about the great things happening why is that the only thing we ever hear is crime Stein which is ridiculous because there are great things happening at school every day and there's wonderful arts programming that's combined with IB that you actually cannot get almost anywhere else that great combination and we would love to have an opportunity to highlight some of the programming and what's special about our schools so if it's not always test scores or the rating but to say hey there's this awesome program at the school and let realtors know because I don't even think people understand what's special about Einstein but the parents that are there they understand and people choose Einstein in fact they're the number one picked school in the Dow County Consortium and we stick up for all I'm not I'm serious we stick up for all of our schools because my neighbors go to Northwood and their neighbors you know might go to Kennedy so I think that we need to think about schools differently as a whole and this will solve a lot of our problems and, yeah and I do agree that it'd be wonderful to say all the wonderful things about our schools but I don't know how you make that not cumbersome for realtors when you have 206 schools I'm just not sure how you develop a uniform way to be able to provide that other information maybe the realtors could get creative on this <laughs> uh, from a buyer point of view I think the expectation setting part is very important what is I mean all the bill is really doing is saying don't expect the school to remain 
attached to this house forever, right? That is the expectation today, and slowly we have to change that expectation. I think that is the purpose of the rule. It's an expectation setting rule. It doesn't, it won't give you immediate results, I don't believe, and but it will over time make it happen so that people say, yes, I could move. Right now this, they say, oh, I can't move. Would, would the expectation setting be more appropriate at the time that you're signing your contract with your realtor to search for houses rather than after you've picked a house? Honestly, that's a great idea. Thank you, Delegate Lutke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to return, Dan, to something you said just a minute ago about Zillow and, and grade schools. Um, and so for the delegation to understand, um, when you're a, a home buyer and you're pulling up Zillow, um, what do you see in terms of those uh, scores? Uh, sure, there'll be a little ranking somewhere down the page. It'll say greatschools.org, and there'll be the listing the list in elementary school, a middle school, and a high school, and then it'll be a score next to each one on a 1 to 10 scale, 1 being the worst, 10 being the best. There's really not an explanation of what the score means. You have to click and go through to the greatschools.org website to find that. The scores often, you know, they, they pull from test scores primarily and demographics, but even then you could have two schools that have similar test scores and demographics and have wild scores. I mean, I get a tickle going on there sometimes and seeing, like, it'll say BCC High School and then two. Why? <laughs> like... Uh, it, and, and what terrifies me is that people make decisions based on this. There's a commercial out for, one of, for, for that website now where this couple is out looking for a house. The husband is away at war. The wife is at home looking at houses online, and they're texting back and forth. And she says, oh, no, this house is in a bad school district. We can't live here. And so they cross it off the list. And, like, these are real conversations people have every day. But I, I really don't think... And, and they are valid, right? But I don't think that they should be happening based on bad information from a website that appears in a little box on a real estate website or from a real estate agent who are not education experts, are not in the school, don't may not know the schools very well beyond what they hear from other parents, right? Like, there are so many factors that go into what makes a school good or, more importantly, what makes a school good for a certain family. And that decision has to be made between that family and that school and not... I honestly do not think that actually should be a part of the process of looking for a house or working with an agent. So, uh, Jill, the um, these scores then, great schools in particular, is, is heavily dependent on standardized test scores. And you know because you were on the school board and you've been through the experience that the simplistic ways we have of rating schools based on things like test scores um, are highly correlated with could, I could show you a breakout of our schools by poverty category that matches exactly to that. And it's, it's not just here, it's across the country. The difference between our school district and districts across the country is we're unusual in that our whole county is a school district. So we have the benefit of wealth in our district that we should be able to distribute. And in other school districts like Wake County, North Carolina, they actually make sure that they don't have any school over a certain poverty level. But here, we've been willing to let our schools separate and continue to separate because people are looking at these scores. Sure. And so the result of that is if I have money and I don't know enough about educational rankings, to understand how flawed these scores are, I'm going to end up being steered towards wealthier, whiter school districts, self-segregated. And if I don't have money, I'm going to end up in a school with a higher farms rate that will continue to increase right. and likely a majority minority school. Because people say that they want to buy into the school, the best school that they can afford. That's what they say. So what's happened is that if you are a black or brown student in Montgomery County, you are multiple times more likely to be in a high poverty school, and even more so if you're an English language learner. So we're putting our students who are already impacted by poverty and carrying that burden in our schools that are the most impacted by poverty, and the statistics speak very plainly, only one and a half percent of high poverty schools across the country only one and a half percent are consistently high performing. I mean, it's just, it's not rocket science. If you have third grade, in third grade, you have 10 kids, you have uh, 10 different reading levels in your classroom. 
as compared to three different levels in your reading classroom, the load that the teacher had in meeting all of the students' needs is very different. And in our highest poverty schools, we also have high mobility rates. So we have um, kids coming in and out. We have schools that have 25% mobility rates, meaning one out of every four kids is coming in and out of the school during the school year. So that's a lot. We have kids coming in um, who have, are, have just arrived from other countries, have unidentified special education learning needs, speak other languages that other kids or teachers in the school may or may not speak. I mean, it's a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Resnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. D Dan, I have a quick question for you, uh, since you're the licensed realtor on the, on the panel. Um, now, I'm a licensed attorney, but I'm not a practicing attorney, so I don't even know the answer to this question. But I watch my father-in-law go through the real estate licensing process, so I might actually rely on you more than my own knowledge. If I put into the MRS, if I'm selling a house and I put into MRIS that I have a brand new roof, and that brand new roof turns out to be 10 years old and a leak in it, there's liability for that, isn't there? That's absolutely right. So if I put in that there are five bedrooms in a house, but one of those bedrooms that was counted is in the basement and there's no external egress and that was missed in closing, there's liability for that, right? That's right. So if I say that I have a four-year-old kid and I want that four-year-old kid to go to Resnick Elementary. <laughs> we do have one, by the way. We do have one. And it's in District 39. Um, and by the time that kid turns six, the boundary changed because we built another school, but the expectation when I bought that house was that my kid is going to that school. Shouldn't there be liability for that? That's a good question. It's, I think it is a different kind of material fact than a roof or the number of bedrooms. But the way that we've presented it to buyers, especially in accounting where boundaries have not been redrawn wholesale since the 90s, is that the school is as much a part of your house as the roof or the number of bedrooms. And, and I think there are a lot of families who understand that's not the case. My mother, who's a real estate agent, bought her house in 1999 with only a vague understanding of what school it was, but that it was kind of near my middle school and unintentionally had moved me out of my middle school catchment. And I'm saying that to say we lived, number one, and number two, that uh, we need to let buyers know that the school doesn't come with the house, which a lot of people have not caught on to that. And you can see that around this conversation around school boundaries. People think the house is attached to the school, like the roof, and it's not. And that's the point of this bill. To that point, there's actually a, a fa private Facebook group now with over 1,700 people that has completely started to fight potential redistricting in Montgomery County. Thank you, Delia Barbe. Uh, yeah, well, I definitely like the part of the bill that says you have to be informed that the school districts aren't f uh, forever. And I'm leaning in favor of the first part that I was questioning earlier. But here's the thing. If we pass this bill as it's written and people just go on the Internet to find out what the school district is anyway, what, what will we have accomplished? I think it's expect again to repeat myself. It's, it's expectation setting, right? So I think MCPS should have a disclaimer as well that says you are not bound to this house is not uh, tied to the school, right? That's the expectation setting. It's going to take a few years and the next round of uh, home sales for for uh, this to to come about. But right now the expectation is you're buying the school. Really, if you look at Dan's two um, school, uh, two houses, right? What is the price premium there? It's the school, right? So if you're not bound to the school, then you know it actually speaks to housing affordability as well. Well, I, I graduated from Paint Branch High School, so maybe I'm not getting it, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not with a great a great grade point average though, but. Uh, um, but 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 here's but I still though I mean if we if we pass this law the way this bill the way it is and it goes into law and people look up this information anyway, I just don't feel that we will have accomplished anything. It's just the responsible thing to do. Even if nothing happens, I don't think that nothing will happen. What we're preventing is from 
primarily real, like as a real estate agent, when I start with a buyer, I give them a sheet that says, I'm not Madam a structural Chair. engineer. I'm not an architect. I'm not a plumber. I can't give you advice on those things. What this is effectively saying is the person you're hiring to help you buy a house or to help you sell a house is also not an expert on schools and should not be consulted for that information. The buyer or seller can go off and get whatever information they want. They're going to do that now. They're going to do that in the future. But the difference is one potential source of bad information that is, frankly, making our school system more segregated and less effective will be gone. Paint Branch High School is an excellent school, but people do not advertise it the way they advertise Whitman. And that has a lot to do with what people think will sell and perceptions about that school. Thank you, Delegate Stewart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm sensing widespread agreement on the point of Delegate Moon's bill regarding the um, disclosure that the, the school districts aren't forever, which you know is exciting personally as a co-sponsor of the bill. What I'm sensing more uh, dissension about is this idea about whether we should provide all information about what school, you know, schools for every district, or whether we should provide no information and provide no school districts. And so, um, I think that both Delegate Lukey and sort of piggybacking on Delegate Lukey and Delegate Kelly, both of whom I think made good points. Um, I have two concerns, I think, about providing all the information. And Mr. Reed, I'd like you your opinion on it. And I guess I should add the disclaimer that Mr. Reed is actually my realtor. Um, he helped me purchase my, my most recent house in the Magruder cluster. Um, so, um, in fact, that was the first thing I asked him. He said, oh, I've got just the house for now. Um, so uh, so my, fir my, first, uh, my first question is, are we speaking out of both sides of our mouth? Would you be... Um, uh, concern that we'd be speaking out of both sides of our mouth if we on the one hand said your school district boundaries aren't forever and on the other hand we said here's the school it's awesome and said nice things about it I, I think hmm. <laughs> I'm in other words, were those question? messages I mean do you think that like buyers or and or realtors would would view those as contradictory to both say here are the schools they're great fantastic awesome schools here's what they're called but also, they're not forever. Is that would that be contradictory or not? I mean, I think they're not contradictory. If we lived in a county where you would be redistricted from one excellent school to another, and to be perfectly frank, I I think that actually does exist. I think no matter where you go into Montgomery County schools, you're going to do pretty well, especially if you come from a comfortable background. That's what studies tend to show. Um, I do not think that real estate agents should be in the business of telling people about schools in Montgomery County. And then I guess my second question, and maybe my most, my uh, more serious one, is if we view this, as Delegate Luthi was saying, as sort of a the next generation of racial steering. And we're viewing, and basically everyone knows that, you know, uh, Martin Luther King High School, if everyone knows, it's the black high school. You know, for, pardon me for, you know, using sort of blunt language. And everyone knows that Donald J. Trump High School is the white high school, right? <laughs> if everyone knows that, then to me, saying that this that this cluster that this school is in the Trump cluster and this school is in the King cluster, saying both of those things seems like it's going to actually increase segregation. Whereas now we just say one of them, right? I mean, according to Delegate Moon's testimony, right now what we're seeing is the Trump High School is advertised. God forbid. But the king, the king name is not used, right, to use this example right now. So one is used and one is not. To me, by using both names, if the school district is a proxy for race, we're actually going to be making the problem worse. Does that make sense? Is my concern valid? No, I, I think so. I mean, people do come with a lot of baked-in perceptions about schools. And I, I think the ideal scenario is one in which buyers do their due diligence, as they should with everything else when they buy a house and learn about what are offered at the different schools. I, I did a video, video with Jill <laughs> like two years ago about how to find a good school. And Jill, if I paraphrase you incorrectly, let me know. Your answers were go to the school, meet with the principal, and learn everything you can. Yeah. Go to the website, yeah. see what's offered at the school, see what unique programming they have. You know? It's not look at the demographics and test scores. Thank you, uh, Delia Lukey. Sorry, Madam Chair, I know I've been talkative on this one. Um, but to Delegate Barbe's point, because I think it's a really valid concern, Dan, 
1968 Fair Housing Act says real estate agents cannot steer people on the basis of race to housing, right? That's right. Right. But and and 13 other protected classes. Right. But it it is still perfectly legal and probably happens that a person could go to the American Community Survey and look up the racial demographics in the neighborhoods their houses that they were looking at are in and choose to live in a neighborhood based on race, right? They can, and a real estate agent is not supposed to be involved in that. I'll give you an example. I was at an open house a few months ago, and a woman came, pointed to the, the Rosary Vir and Virgin Mary in front of the house next door, and demanded to know if the neighbors were Catholic. And I said, I cannot tell you that. I cannot tell you that at all. And she said, well, you know, they have all these toys in the front. They have to be Catholic. They have so many kids. And I said, I absolutely cannot tell you about this. And that's what real estate agents are supposed to do. Sure. So just like under this proposed bill, real estate agents wouldn't be telling people what schools were in, you know, this, this house was in. People could still look it up. But the Fair Housing Act has had an effect in reducing segregation as a result of steering, right? It still had an effect, even though people can still look up the racial information on their own. I think, it, I think one thing we have to remember with all of the civil rights legislation is that they made these things illegal, but that's not something, you know, that, that condition is not permanent, right? There are all these things that we have to constantly be doing as a society to make sure that the intention of those things are being carried out and to, and to ensure that, that people are actually creating the kind of society we want to make. You know, Fair Housing Act made those things illegal. People can go off and be racist, sure, they will. Uh, what I'm I think what this bill is trying to say is that the real estate industry in Montgomery County should not abet that. Thank you. Delegate Solomon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I think this has been a really fascinating conversation as a, as a especially as a former teacher. And I think there's been a lot of points made uh, on both sides that have been really, really impactful. Um, so I guess it seems sort of to me in some ways the happy middle ground here is just sort of like, and, and tell me if you think this is right as a, as a real estate agent, Dan, you know, if I pull up a, a listing on my phone right now on, on Redfin, it's going to tell me, you know, in sort of the bottom part of the listing, like the subdivision, just the nuts and bolts, this is the subdivision. It's not going to tell me this subdivision is wonderful, this community association has great neighbors, or this community association has been at war with one another for, you know, 100 years. It just says the subdivision is the village of X or, you know, the citizens association of Y. And if I want to go online and look up the website of what that community association is, maybe some of them have a great splashy page with all this HTML wonderful stuff, maybe some don't have a website just literally tells me the subdivision. So uh, it, to me, it seems like the splitting the baby here, so to speak, is the, th the listing can say the school. It says your school is X, your middle school is Y, your high school is, is Z, with no editorializing. And if you ask your realtor what school is this zone for, they can say your school is zoned for Magruder, your school is zoned for Whitman, BCC, whatever it is, and that's it. And if you want to learn more, I suggest you visit MCPS website or you visit the school, end of story, instead of saying BCC is the world's greatest school, Einstein is the world's greatest school, oh, and, you know, and Whitman's terrible, right? Does that seem like sort of a split the baby middle ground here where you can still find the information if it's really important to you, but you need to do that extra layer of, of research to find out what that actually means? So on the multiple listing service, there are two places where you can enter school information. One is this little automated thing at the bottom where you punch in, where it actually connects you to the MCPS website, you punch in the address, and it just generates the schools. Um, that's when when I am entering the listing into the MRIS backend. The other place is in the listing description itself. It's not, my understanding of Delegate Moon's bill is that it would address the listing description, signage, flyers, advertising. Um, I know that there, I've seen listings, and I recognize there are agents who actually don't even put the school information in the area set aside for it. And it, you'll see in a listing, and it might just say, call the school board. Because they might feel, as we've talked about so far, kind of liable. Like, if the school school changes, they have already, they want to make sure that nobody has the wrong idea. Thank you so much. Any other questions? S Sunil, only because you're my leadership Montgomery classmate. Quickly, your last <laughs> comment. I was just going to give you a personal anecdote. So. In 2016, when we started, uh, look, we, look, we were looking for a home. Uh, I remember Zillow being wrong on multiple houses with respect to what schools that they were going to, just for 
um, just, you know, take that for what it is. I quickly want to give a shout out to the student yes. because the students have been amazing and a leader on this issue. Our students have actually been leaders on this issue and they've taken it on as a priority. I don't know if you just want to say a word about that really quickly. Um, sure. Um, so I think the huge distinction that needs to be made here between um, a buyer, you know, I've never bought a house before, but um, a buyer going out and doing their own research on where, what the local school is going to be for a house that they're going to be buying and a company literally advertising that school is, I think as a society, we shouldn't be allowing and promoting the commercialization of school districts because that's just leading to de facto segregation and, and, and increased racial intolerance. Um, so I think that's where the big line here is. Um, there were a lot of students that wanted to be here with me today but couldn't, um, so I'm really happy that I was able to represent the student voice here today. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much for your leadership and thank you to this panel. We are now going to move into the opposition. We have Deborah Cornbluth, Berger, Keith Schenk, Hesse Harris, and Eric Stewart. You can go ahead. How about my person all the way to the left here, if you can start? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, so I'm Hesse Harris, and I do oppose this bill. And having sat here and listened to some of these um, comments, I'm going to stay mentioned some of my concerns here. They're um, ethical and um, legally questionable. But I'm also going to try to address some of the other things that have been said. And so I'm going to, I am going to, uh, as I said, I've got two minutes, so I'm going to do this. In uh, the real estate article, that's uh, section 10711, you make the statement there that a contract can be voided if the school boundaries is one of an of the reasons that a person decides to uh, not not go through with it the word you have is it solely means the buyer can void it they can't void it if, that, if that's the only reason but if they can come up with another one then they can void it what that's going to do is creates the possibility of deception and of dishonesty all a person's got to do is find out the boundaries have changed come up with something so at any rate it puts the seller at a disadvantage also, you have, which is particularly troubling, a portion that says the contract um, has a provision that says that the person um, acknowledges the, uh, the uh, provision that say, states that the um, boundaries might change. Now, in a contract, if you initial something where you said you agree to it, okay, agree to it, accept it, or acknowledge it, that's saying that I do. And, but what happens here is your statute says, your language says, even if they don't sign it, even if they don't initial it, it still holds. So that leaves a person who, uh, a unscrupulous real estate uh, agent can say, okay, or sell, okay, you don't have to sign it if you don't want to. The person goes, okay, I didn't sign that, so therefore it doesn't bind me. But then your statute says it does, and that's wrong. Next person. Hello, I'm Deborah Kornbluth Berger, and I'm here today as a school chair of the Lux Manor Community Association to explain why we oppose Delegate Moon's proposal MC 2020. Our elected representatives in Annapolis have worked for decades protecting consumer rights from unfair and deceptive practices when purchasing items, especially one of the largest items, your home. Mm -hmm. This is why Delegate Moon's proposal is confusing. First, many consumers of real estate, especially those with dependent children, often have purchases they want to buy in an articulated school district or a school district with particular needs and particular programs. Realtors do not direct clients to purchase in a particular community, but if a buyer wants to, they should be able to easily obtain this information. 
If Montgomery County will not allow sellers to disclose their school district, there are pop possibilities that people will start moving to other counties or Virginia or D.C. Mm -hmm. Second, if, look, is it constitutional for sellers to disclose everything about their house but not their district? Mm -hmm. Sellers are required to fill out so many disclosures about their house but not disclose their district to future buyers? Does this make sense to you? We're trying to disclose everything, yet this is a pretty big piece in the puzzle, especially if you have certain needs for certain children that certain schools will give you. That's really important. In addition, our community strongly supported the change in the law to have a moratorium on the development of a school inside the school district if it exceeds 120% of the maximum enrollment. Walter Johnson schools this year for the first time exceeded the 120% threshold and is currently in moratorium. This policy has caused our elected and appointed officials to discuss overcrowding now in schools. Overcrowding is now on the top of people's forefront. We believe that there is an effort to eliminate school clusters through the boundary policy changes, and we're concerned about that. Finally, we're concerned about the message that we're sending to home buyers in that disclosure boundaries can switch any time in Montgomery County. It supports instability as it relates to school assignment. Boundaries should not be changed in a reckless fashion. Currently under MCPS policy, boundaries are reviewed every 18 months prior to opening a new school. There has been no announcement of a change in this policy. In meetings with our community as recently as last month in the WJ community, MCPS officials communicated this repeatedly regarding the opening of the new Woodward High School in 2025. Why does this bill not reflect the current policy? The LCA, Lux Manor Community Association, strongly opposes this bill as we want more information to be easily accessible for our community and we do not believe it should be difficult to obtain the school district information. We want people to know they want to live in the same school district due to certain personal situations that they have that they should be able to get that information easily. Thank you so much. Good evening, De delegates. My name is Keith Shank. Good evening, delegates. My name is Keith Shank, and I'm here as a lifelong Montgomery County resident and a realtor to voice my strong opposition to the MC 2020 bill. I believe this bill is an infringement on our rights, on the rights of Montgomery County property owners. According to Realtor.com, a survey of 1,000 prospective buyers showed that 91% said school boundaries are important in their home search, yet the language of the bill prevents real estate agents from including the name of the school district in any advertisement according to Article C of Business Occupations and Professionals line 17 through 20. Concealing this information from potential property owners is misleading, it's deceitful, and it's unethical, especially knowing how important it is to a buyer when making the most important investment in their lives. It also takes away a family's right to plan their children's education free of disruption. According to lines 10 through 18 of Article A, Real Property, quote, the buyer has no assurance that the current MCPS school assignments for this property will remain in effect for any given period of time, unquote. By granting the local school board the ability to redistrict, quote, at any time, unquote, this bill is codifying the destruction of any lasting sense of community. For those racially and socioeconomically diverse homeowners who have already saved, sacrificed, and selected homes in the current school, in the current system of school districts, the passage of the bill will cost thousands of dollars in property valuations. The rules they followed may be changed without their input or consent and could continue to shift in perpetuity. This bill chains the value of a family's greatest source of wealth to the whims of the school board. This bill will discourage buyers from purchasing homes in Montgomery County of the high risk and uncertainty associated with changing school district. It will diminish our county's prosperity while adversely, adversely affecting the cash flow to our schools and likely damage the real estate market in Montgomery County. We can do better. Instead of trying to pass a bill on infringe upon the rights of Montgomery County taxpayers and inject insecurity turmoil into our communities, you must address the real problems by improving poor performing schools and tackling poverty. Well said. My name is Eric Stewart and I'm a real estate agent. I have been for 32 years. I've sold 3,200 homes myself and my group. Uh, I'm right here in Rockville, Maryland with Long and Foster Realtors. This year I've sold 164 homes already. Um, I believe in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, the American with Disabilities Act of 1990, and all addenda. I treat everybody fairly, honestly, and ethically. And this is 
a question that, that was posed earlier, that is, what is the outcome of this? What are we really trying to accomplish? You know, the multiple listing service says, right on the multiple listing printout of any listing, that the information is deemed reliable, but it's not guaranteed. That's what a buyer gets up front. The buyer already knows that there's no guarantee. A property is sold in its as-is condition at the time of transfer. Once a property's been sold and settled, the new owner takes over the responsibility for that, that uh, refrigerator that Ms. Kelly was talking about that turned into a dog storage unit. <laughs> By the way, I'll take the next four sales in the next 15 years, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in any case, I would just say that, you know, there are bigger issues that have been mentioned here. Uh, Delegate Lukey brought up steering as an issue. You know, we have been instructed my entire career not to talk about the quality of an education from a particular school. We're not here to give subject, subjective opinions about the quality in, of an education at a particular school. I grew up and went to Cold Spring Elementary School. I graduated from Thomas Wooten High School. I went to the University of Maryland. I studied theater. I got into real estate out of college. In my whole career, I have never told people, you should go to this school or you should go to that school. In my whole career, never. And I have never actually seen another agent do this. So the idea that steering is somehow going to be maybe mitigated in some fashion by addressing this in this way, I think is, is mistaken. I do think that the idea Ariana brought up, Delegate Kelly brought up, that we put something into the REA addendum. It's an eight-page addendum that gives disclosure about the parks, the schools, everything about the county. Essentially, it's a buyer beware. If we were to put language into that addendum up front when a buyer purchases a home, they're probably going to forget it anyways, to be frank with you. They're going to be told, hey, there's no guarantee. I don't expect it. But at least they're told, and I think that's our fear here. Our fear is that a buyer buys something and that somehow that they'll be taken advantage of in the process. I would agree with the gentleman next to me. I think that there are many homeowners, including probably many of you who bought because of the school district that you wanted to put your children into. And I like what Warren Buffett says. The price is what you pay, but the value is what you get. And the value is not just the four walls and the roof. It's the school district. It's the location. It's the feng shui. It's all many things all together. Thank you for your time. Hi, um, my name is Eric Eisenman. I'm uh, here as an individual. I'm not a realtor. Uh, I wasn't asked to come here uh, by a realtor or by anybody else. Um, it sounded for a minute like I was at a Board of Education meeting <laughs> when the proponents were up here, uh, so I was glad to find out I was still at the council meeting. Um, I grew up in West Virginia in a very poor county, and I can tell you that even then when we moved there, my dad wanted to know what school was tied to the house. Um, and uh, basically the location of my house uh, in relation to the school. Um, and I recently bought a home here in Montgomery County, and I did it without a realtor. I searched MLS listings on Redfin and other websites, and every one of them showed me what the school um, schools were that were associated to the, to the property. Um, I also disagree with the proponents that um, the schools are segregated in this county. I'm coming from West Virginia. I know that sounds crazy, but... Um, uh, the information packet for our daughter's elementary school that we signed up for when we moved here was in seven different languages. So I'd, I'm not sure how you can call that not diverse. Um, and I just want to say this, um, the information that is on the MLS listings and on the realtor listings was very helpful to us when we came to buy our house. Um, in the economic crash in 2008, it was fueled by real estate lending that was out of control. The Obama administration created the Consumer Financial Prote Protection Bureau. And they determined that transparency is paramount uh, to protecting consumers. Their mission goals are to empower, to enforce, and to educate. The CFPB mission statement says we arm people with information, steps, and tools uh, that will make, allow them to make smart financial decisions. We arm them with information so they can make smart financial decisions. And that is what the information is on the MLS listings. Um, that we consumers are going to look at when we're considering buying a home. Um, it seems that this bill might be a, an opposition thank to you. transparency. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we, we are actually going to go now to questions from my colleagues. Um, Delia Shetty. Okay. 
Um, thank you all for coming out tonight and um, sharing your perspective. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to ask a question for a couple of you who um, shared your thoughts about the importance of transparency. Um, do you believe that there is a distinction between providing information in an advertisement or in the listing? So like providing in the listing the information upfront about what schools somebody is currently zoned to, again, noting that maybe that this is reviewed periodically by the Board of Education every 18 months and that it could change um, in, the, in the listing versus I'm seeing an increase in the number of Facebook ads and other ways that realtors locally are publicizing um, listings. And I think there's a distinction between an advertisement that lists in a social media advertisement or on a large banner as you're driving by that a school district is tied to or a specific school is tied to a home. Um, but I'd just be curious to hear whether you all view a distinction between an advertisement and information that is transparently available in the listing. If you don't mind, I'll speak to this. Thank you. So, I think that uh, the real estate agent bears a responsibility of full disclosure about the condition of a property. They bear the responsibility to make sure that they disclose the age of a roof or how many bedrooms are in the house. But ultimately, the buyer has to go through evaluating whether that information is correct or not for themselves. They go through an inspection period and whatnot. They go to settlement and they own the property. But what conveys with the property is not the school district. What conveys with the property is the property. It's the house. It's the land. It's not the school district. It's not the shopping center. Westfields one day won't be there, right? Einstein High School, where I went for summer school for the performing arts, will change one day. You know, it, it will be a different, things that are outside of the property don't convey with the property. You get the The second part of the bill that says that you have to disclose that there is the likely, or that it might change in the future. So that's precisely what I would say. Okay. I think in the REA addendum, if you were to put up front, just say, buyer, be aware that school districts can change according to the county council's decision making and whatnot, however you want to word it. I think it's fine. You're giving information to the buyer to let them know that the house conveys, the walls convey, but not the school district, right? And we get benefits for the taxes that we pay. We expect to have a school district that we're going to get based upon the information that's provided. But there's no guarantee that next year it's not going to be something different. Okay, yeah. so, so that answers my second question that I was intending to ask, which is whether you support the notion of transparency in that component. But um, do you believe that there is a distinction between advertising about a school um, versus posting it in the uh, whatever the listing? So I, I would say no, uh, because you're telling the truth either way. You're telling it in the multiple listing service that this is information, right? And you're telling people out on the street that this is in the Wooten cluster. They're going to find out what the elementary, middle, or high school is. It's, it's up to them. You're giving them information to the best of your knowledge. If you're misrepresenting the truth at that point in time, then you're lying. But if at that point in time it is true that that's in the wooden cluster, then you're doing nothing wrong. Interesting. Okay. Could I say something? Um, I think I, I don't understand how um, eliminating disclosure of the information is going to be helpful um, uh, to, to anyone. And whether it's repeated in the listing and in the advertisement, uh, I agree with Mr. Stewart. It, um, it's the truth. And everyone that goes to a closing will sit across the table, not just from the realtor, uh, not just from the person selling the house, but from a lawyer. And hopefully you've picked a good closing agent, and they'll tell you directly. These schools, they may not be aligned with your property, at least ours did. Um, and so you, you have to be responsible as a consumer to educate yourself not only on what exists at the time you buy, but what could happen in the future. And so there's an element of personal responsibility that I think this bill should consider, that people should be responsible for understanding what they're getting into when they're buying a home, which is the most important financial decision many of them will make. So. All right, thank you. Delegate Collison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, so I just want to clarify that I think I heard the the sponsor say or the lead sponsor say that um, he's not he's so certainly open to disclosing which school um, which feeder schools are 
currently, at present time, but maybe changed, are attached to a house. So, you know, I, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that, that there's an openness to that. I'm not hearing that be shut off. So the question I have, particularly for the realtors, is um, I also heard the delegates say that in many of the listings for Whitman, the Whitman School and a description of the Whitman School was included. But in the, for the homes in the Einstein cluster, nothing about Einstein and its, um, and its value and, and what it contributes was in the advertisements. There was only one, I'm not sure I'm going to have the numbers right, but one out of 12 listings that he looked at in homes in the Einstein cluster, I believe. So if we're about transparency, what, help me understand why the Einstein School wasn't named. I've, I looked at homes in, in Montgomery County, uh, all over Montgomery County, and I looked at, at some in the Einstein cluster, and the names of the schools were associated with the, with the listings. I'm not sure. I don't think you can hide the, the school's mm -hmm. association based on what the other realtor was saying. When you punch it in the address and the school system information loads, I never once found a listing in, I looked in Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, I looked in Rockville, Potomac, I looked in Bethesda. I never once found a listing where the school information wasn't was pr presented. So, and My career started on College View Drive, which is in the Einstein Cluster. And I farmed 700 homes, expanded that to 1,000 homes, delivering apple butter to every single home personally on College View, Maple View, Newport Mill Road, up and down Adams Drive, Lantern Drive, the Hammond Wood subdivision of Goodman Contemporaries. I know the area back and forth. And every time I put a house on the market, I put it on the market, mentioning the elementary, the middle, and the high school. So I'm not really sure. I can't speak to hearsay. All I can speak to is what I see, which is what he said, is that there are agents who are trained in the business to say nothing about the school at all other than see school board. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily a decision that they're making so that they don't reveal something that they know. It's oftentimes because they don't know. If you don't sell a lot of properties in a particular area, you may not be able to know how to speak to that, or you may be young in the business. You know, I, These days, information is so relatively available. What we're talking about is diminutive. We have information available for everybody. If they want to find out what school it is, they'll find it out. And hiding it, we create boundaries so people know whether they can go in or out of an area, and they know whether they're in or out of an area. So let's just call it a boundary. Let's leave it a boundary. The bigger issue that you've mentioned tonight, which is you're struggling with school boundaries and you're struggling with how to fund and how to deal with overpopulation, to my mind, this doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. It really is more about giving good information that people can rely on. And if you want to make sure that information is reliable and universal, then work through Bright MLS and then have the school information populated automatically if you can do that, but I'm not sure you can. Otherwise, you know, focus people up front, be aware, here are three websites where you can find out where the school district is for your location. And do it as, as a part of the upfront process. They'll have a home inspection contingency if they want. They'll have an appraisal contingency. They could throw in a five-day school contingency. You know what I'm saying? You want to give people the rights to make decisions, that's fine. I think we're all for that. Before the next person speaks, if you're not speaking, please turn your mic off. Oh. Uh, I, please turn your mic off. So sorry. Yeah. A comment I have on that is I agree that it should be in bright MLS. I agree we should. Just like someone else said, I think from an earlier panel, is that Zillow, for instance, just one of the you know companies, just has the wrong school information. I think if everything is consistent, and I think that that's number one importance, is again, full disclosure, consistency, and making sure everyone has the proper information, not information that they just on their own get out. And I think that's really important to me. So if I might, Madam Chair, just one more thing. Just so what I'm hearing you all say basically is you're okay with giving information, but there should be consistency. So how about we just direct them to the school board, period. We don't give them any information other than what the school current school, feeder school pattern is for that catchment area period, and for more information, go to mcps.org. But just like I said, Zillow and other companies are still going to come out with what they think will be it. Again, we need to be accurate and to have one source 
that comes out with accurate information is a lot more important than to have several different sources at several different companies, and I think that's really important, is accuracy as much as we can at the time. So, and, and if I may. Wait a minute. So Zillow is a third party. Where is it getting its information from? Um, well, uh, again, even someone said before, <laughs> again, just go over there, but there are several they, there are several different ways if there are houses between two school districts. There is not, there's not a definite if Zillow is correct or they're not correct. And very often you see third party com companies are not using it. That's why we need to have it in one source, just every single thing. If somebody wants, like you had um, your delegate over there, I agree with you. You want to move to the same school district or a particular district that has a need for your child. You should be able to look up the information and find out where that program is located. If that program is, let's say, Tilden Middle School, for instance. Yeah. Whatever school it's at, we should be able to easily in one source and not have a third party be involved. Shouldn't that source be the school board information? That's inconvenient. It's just inconvenient. If I go to, okay. to search for the 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 schools the house that I live in that I'm going to want to buy and I can't figure out where the school is and then I've got to go open my phone and call up MCPS and type in the address I got to do that for 50 houses that I'm looking at it's inconvenient it's not realistic and frankly it's a free country people can make a decision an informed decision the CFPB thinks everybody should be informed about everything related to fi financing a home and buying a home why wouldn't we want to know where the school what what the schools are that are tied to the home to make our informed decision and, and i'm saying you'll know what the schools are it's just the information about the schools that i want to be consistent and i trust the school system over the realtor thank you madam chair why thank would you so much we i think um the, there aren't any additional questions um are there any questions from any of my colleagues before we close this um particular bill Okay, um, we are going to conclude the hearing on MC 2020, Montgomery County Residential Property Advertisements and Sales. We are going to go a little bit out of order. We're going to take PGMC 104-20, Montgomery County Land Use Document Certification uh, by Senator Kramer. I would like to call up Bailey Condry and also Carol and Barth in support. Good evening, chairs, colleagues. Uh, ben Kramer here to introduce PGMC 104-20. Uh, this bill should be somewhat familiar as the delegation did take it up last session. Uh, it is back again this session. Uh, and if for no other reason, it's because on a cold, drizzly winter night, it made Bob Benton get out of his warm, cozy bed in Baltimore and drive to Montgomery County to oppose it. Um, the bill, uh, as you may or may not recall, simply requires that a particular land use document that relates to uh, forestry in the development process be signed under penalty of perjury. There are multiple documents relating to development process that do require the document be signed under penalty of perjury. There are others that do not. I can't explain the rhyme or the reason why some do, some do not, but it is a very common practice and this legislation is by no means breaking new ground of any kind. Now, when I approached the Maryland National Capital uh, Park and Planning Commission about the legislation a year and a half ago, I met with uh, quite a few of their attorneys who indicated, yes, there has been a problem with this particular application 
and misrepresentations and while they were agnostic as to whether we should or should not require the certification under uh, perjury, they indicated, let us prepare the language. So the language you see in the document did come from the Merrill National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and that was fine. Uh, the goal was, let's just get to what it is we're seeking to accomplish. Um, to give you some idea about the frequency with which this is a requirement, I simply Googled some of the documents that we have in county and state government. And so to give you an idea, in Montgomery County's requirements dealing with forestation, within 10 minutes, I found three of their application forms related to the far Montgomery County Forest Conservation Law, all of which require it be signed under the penalty of perjury. Within the Montgomery County Department of Permitting Services, applications for stormwater management signed under penalty of perjury. Sediment com co control permit application under penalty of perjury. If you want an application for a park construction permit signed under penalty of perjury. If you want to sell to the Park and Planning Commission goods or services, the application you submit to the Park and Planning Commission signed under penalty of perjury. You want to buy a boat in the state of Maryland or trade in a boat in the state of Maryland? You have to fill out a form that's signed under penalty of perjury. The Housing Opportunities Commission has forms right here in Montgomery County, documents signed under penalty of perjury. Our wonderful folks in the great municipality of Chevy Chase, you want to get an application for a special permit in Chevy Chase? The application is signed under penalty of perjury. And finally, and this will be a conversation we'll have next week, you want to evict somebody? You sign it under penalty of perjury. So my point to you all is that from what I feedback I got last year, uh, concerns about this bill, was that somehow the notion of signing it under penalty of perjury was a new step, a dramatic step, I can assure you when Mr. Enton comes up here, he's going to try to convince you that it is. But the fact of the matter is, it is not. And if, in fact, the applicant is legitimately submitting, and I'll read to you the language, it says, under penalty of perjury, this document, including any accompanying form, statement, maps, or drawings, has been examined by me and the information contained herein. To the best of my knowledge, nobody's being asked, hey, I, you know, you're, this is it. If you make a, you know, if you're wrong on this, you're done for. The fact of the matter is, best of my knowledge, information, and reasonable belief that it's true, correct, and complete. If, in fact, the individual signing this document believes that, then let them sign it under penalty of perjury because there will be no harm, no foul, if, in fact, they're signing it to the best of their knowledge, information, and reasonable belief. Um, there is, again, merit to the need for this particular document as was indicated when I met with Park and Planning Commission, but I will allow uh, a couple of the witnesses that are here to discuss that at greater length. So with that, thank you. My name is Carol Ann Barth. I'm here for the Montgomery County Civic Federation. We represent communities all across the county 
For purposes of identification only, I'm a third generation Montgomery County resident, certified Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, founding board member of the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, and I manage tree canopy programs for Prince George's Department of the Environment. What we have here is a very simple bill to close a loophole. Why do we have to close the loophole? Woody Guthrie said it best, some men rob you with a six gun, some men rob you with a fountain pen. I've talked with some of you about this legislation and you always ask me, is there a problem? Well, as Woody might say, boy howdy, is there? Because there has been bad behavior. There are limits of disturbance lines, natural features like streams or specimen trees that are simply left off of plans or moved wholesale to a different part of the plan. And by so doing, certain unscrupulous developers have been able to gain more developable land out of a parcel or have been able to evade uh, environmental restrictions or tree conservation replanting requirements. So that's what we're trying to do here. And let's not forget the most famous case of Farm Road where leaving a road off of a plan dispossessed 11 families, African American families from land they had held since emancipation. Okay, let me say, uh, so why don't people just sue if this happens? I don't know about you, but I can't afford to sue a wealthy developer. And in most of the communities where these kinds of shenanigans go on, neither can the affected residents. Um, and it's a matter of fairness. In addition to everything that Senator Kramer mentioned, if you as a homeowner want to get a permit to put a fence around your petunia patch, you swear under penalty of perjury. And can you honestly tell me that a developer affecting hundreds of acres of trees should be held to a lighter standard than I should? We all sign that way anytime we register a car, pay our taxes, or apply for a mortgage. Again, this is just a loophole, but it's a loophole that some people exploit to the detriment of our communities and our environment, and I implore you to close the sleep hole. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Bailey Condry. I live in Kensington. Uh, I'm a certified Chesapeake Bay landscape professional. Uh, I was the Lorax for Halloween, a few Halloween, uh, Halloween, yeah, Halloween. I was the Lorax for Halloween, so I sort of, I'm here for the trees. Um, Montgomery County finds itself in the third year of its self-declared climate emergency three days hence. When the declaration was announced, the council said that the task would require everyone, including government, citizens, businesses, nonprofits, and other institutions, to work together. Everyone working together leaves very little room for exceptions. You don't create loopholes for special interest, and the loopholes that get eliminated are the ones that exist. Every year, science reveals more about the benefits that trees provide to mankind and nature, something nature has always known. The world finds itself in the midst of a sixth mass extinction event pushed along by the unfolding climate catastrophe, and we still allow trees to be removed from the landscape because someone lied. I could spend the entire three minutes of my time talking about the benefits that trees provide, but then I wouldn't have anything else to say. Uh, asking everyone to swear under penalty of perjury that trees under their oversight will be protected is simply logical. Allowing fraudulent development documents to be submitted by anyone for any reason makes a mockery of the county's greenhouse gas reduction goals. And I urge you to support this bill. Thank you so much. Any questions? All right, wonderful. Thank you so much to this panel. We will now, we will now call up the opposition, Robert Enton.
Is that on? Good afternoon. Good evening. I am Robert Enton, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Building Industry Association. Uh, in opposition to the bill, uh, I have discussed the bill with Senator Kramer at length. Um, a very pleasant conversation, as you can imagine. And um, uh, the one thing that I was interested to try to find out, and I raised this with Senator Kramer when we spoke last night, were specific examples that give rise to the need for this bill. Um, the Maryland building industry represents over 1,100 companies that employ over 100,000 people in the state of Maryland. We rely on engineers. We rely on consultants. We rely on forestry uh, people. Montgomery County probably has the most comprehensive uh, uh, planning uh, uh, ordinance and regulations and process in the state by far. The applications that get filed are often hundreds of pages long with plats, with drawings, with uh, reports from, en from engineers and different experts. The uh, a county has the ability, if it wants to, under current state law, to adopt a local ordinance that would do exactly what this, this bill does. I know I have limited time, but one of the things I want to call your attention to is the language in the bill. The bill says that this, uh, the subdivision regulations shall require an applicant to sign a certification of the penalties of perjury and then look on, beginning on lines 22 uh, of the uh, page 3, and a concept plan or any other local development plan that does not require either a natural resources inventory, forest stand delineation, or forest conservation plan exemption. Now that language means that every single plan, an application for every single plan, forget about it, nothing to do with trees, would have to be made under penalties of perjury. And I ask yourselves to put yourselves in the position of my clients. I have an LLC. I have engineers. I have consultants. I have forestry experts. And they're the ones that, that, that comply, that do what needs to be done to comply with the law. Under the current certification today, they sign the certification. Not the LLC, not the investor, not the head of the LLC. I understand that there are other statutes that call for penalties of perjury, but I've yet to ever see a regulation or a statute, and I raised this with Senator Kramer, and he may be amenable to an amendment to deal with this issue, that says that it's to in my reasonable, the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, as the lawyers in the room know and others of you may know, that's kind of standard language. What I've never seen anywhere is to the best of my uh, 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 information, uh, knowledge, and reasonable Thank you, Bob. Okay, and reasonable belief. Okay. That's a standard thank that you, doesn't Bob. exist anywhere. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Mr. It was Enten. a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Senator Kramer. Thank you for that, Madam Chair. And what a pleasure it is to see you, Mr. Enton. And I am ever so pleased that you chose to come all the way from Baltimore on this evening to be with us. Um, I just want to share with you, as I did the delegation, uh, with regard to this issue of reasonable belief. And I personally don't think I would have any problems simply striking reasonable and sticking with belief. But when you said you've never seen that utilized anywhere, I will proffer to you that I am holding other documents, and again, this language was in fact drafted by counsel at the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, and they have other documents that use that exact same but language. Not under penalties of perjury, Senator. I beg to that differ certification, with you. Certification, reasonable I, belief, I don't believe says it's, that under It's penalties language of that came from park and planning, so I'm just sharing okay, with well, you, I'll, 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 but Mr. I would Ensign, not let's have, let him finish, please. I would not have any, you. you know, concerns or angst striking the reasonable from the belief if, in fact, that would give you the necessary comfort to sit there and say you're all in and you support the legislation because well, it's know, the right thing to do. I, uh, of course, I can't make those decisions. Only my clients can. That was a concern that I had. I had not seen that language anywhere where reasonable belief was tied to uh, perjury. You know, perjury in the state of Maryland, uh, if you commit the crime of perjury, you can be in prison for 10 years in the state of Maryland. So it's a very serious matter. 
to to uh, have these uh, certifications made under penalties of perjury. And it raises a concern, obviously, with my members, as I think it would with any of you, if you were required to sign an affidavit to, to, to that effect. But I appreciate that, Senator, and I know that you and I discussed that. Also, we're very concerned about the broad nature of the bill. It's not just forestry. And what would be helpful to me, if someone would give me one example of where they went to the uh, Board of Plan, to the Planning Commission in Montgomery County and filed a complaint saying that a part of an application was false and um, uh, they believe that it was intentionally false. That's the first, I'm, I'm not aware of that. We had a discussion with Park and Planning. They did not indicate to us that they had such a complaint. And I'd point out to the delegation that no one is here from uh, Parks and Planning to support the bill. No one is here from the county to support the bill. Uh, but having said all that, if I can work it out with Senator Kramer, it'll be a wonderful event. So I will try very hard to do that. Thank you for that, Madam Chair. Mr. Anton. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, that concludes the hearing on PGMC 104-20. We will now start the hearing on MC 2420, Montgomery County Distracted Driving Monitoring Systems. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair. Um, before us now is MC 24-20. The timing on this is fortuitous. Um, yesterday in Australia, which I think for them was today by the magic of hemispheres, um, uh, Australia um, enacted that country's first distracted driving monitoring program. Um, they are the second to do so. The Netherlands did so recently as well. And so um, at the request of council member Tom Hawker, who has a constituent who works in this space, um, this bill in front of us provides a pilot program for enacting a distracted driving monitoring program here in Montgomery County. The program is designed to mimic our speed camera program, uh, which was first piloted here in Montgomery County before it was allowed statewide. Some bills, as you've seen tonight, come before you fully birthed, fully formed, fully vetted. Um, this bill is in its infancy, still in Kuwait. Um, I know Council Member Hucker and his Chief of Staff, Dave Hunes, who many of you know, um, would like to come before the subcommittee to which this bill is assigned, um, as well as his constituent who works in the technology area um, on which this bill is based. And so uh, with that, I'll uh, conclude my remarks and happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much. Any questions? Oh, Delia Love. Good evening, Senator. A um, couple of questions for you. Would these systems be mobile or stationary? Um, I think just like our current speed camera programs, you would likely have both. You would have both. Okay, so in Montgomery County, we have speed cameras. We have red light cameras. We have cameras on our school buses. We've got a bill in front of our committee. We had it last year, we're gonna have it again to have cameras on the vehicles that are protected by the move over law. Then you have private facilities, you have stores, you have ATMs, you have Amazon Ring. When is there enough surveillance? Yeah, so I share your libertarian concerns about the <laughs> proliferation of cameras in our society. Um, I don't believe that these cameras would record a person's presence. Um, I am not deeply familiar with the technology and so as we get the person, um, the constituent of Council Member Hucker who requested the bill in front of the subcommittee will get direct answers to that. But unlike a license plate reader, I believe this camera only snaps when it perceives a violation of our distracted driving laws. That photograph is then forward, forwarded to a sworn police officer who has to make an independent determination prior to uh, mailing out the citation. Okay, following up on that, um, the language of the bill talks about what has to be sent. Um, I'm looking at, let's see, it's on page eight, section D. Um, a recorded image shall include an image of the motor vehicle and an image of at least one of the license plates, time and date of the violation, and to the extent possible, the location of the violation. 
It doesn't say anything about an image of the driver being distracted, nor does anywhere in the bill it define what a distracted driver is. Right. Um, are these things that will be added? Are these things that are intentionally left out? Could you explain to the sure. a little bit more about that? Half and half. So on the second part, the distracted driving, the definition of distracted driving is under current law. So it would, um, it would refer back to what is already in current law. And in my belief, although certainly I defer to the subcommittee and the delegation, um, is not necessary in the bill. The first is, is essentially a mistake of drafting. It was designed to mimic the uh, current speed cameras, which don't require the image of the driver, and so that's why it wasn't included, but of course would, ne you know, by definition need to be included here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any additional questions? Okay, thank you thank so you much, Senator. Senator. All right, we will now bring up the opposition. We have Sharon Barr and Kathy Gugulis. You can begin as soon as you sit down. Thank you. My name is Sharon Bauer. Um, I oppose the authorization of this bill. I'm a resident of Montgomery County. I'm concerned about the overreach of our county government to intervene in the lives of its citizens. I'm very concerned with the amount of taxpayer dollars required to implement and enforce this bill and many others. The proposed bill states over 30 uncertainties. There's a lot of work to do on the bill. The bill is too vague and ambiguous. What is distracted driving? Sneezing, coughing, picking your nose, wind, rain, sleet, and snow, not to mention bicyclists and wildlife. The law enforcement agency is not identified. How will the recorded image be taken? Where will the distracted driver monitor system be installed? At what cost to the Montgomery County taxpayers? What is the civil penalty? Who determines a warning versus citation? What are the problems with rental companies? More personnel and expenses added to the Maryland Motor Vehicle Administration. Way too expensive. This is an invasion of privacy. More time and expenses for the chief judge of the district court. The authorization to implement this bill should be denied, denied and this bill should be withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Kathy Gugulis and I'm a longtime resident of Montgomery County. While the increase in distracted driving should concern everyone, especially in our area where traffic congestion is one of the worst in the country, but with all due respect, I'm concerned that the solution proposed by this bill is impractical, too expensive, and will be overcome by newer in-vehicle technology which is already being introduced. I also have questions about the technology being considered. Can it tell the difference between a driver who's texting and one who is uh, is trying to dodge uh, a pothole, a deer, a bicyclist, or other vehicle that swerves into their lane? Will drivers incur large fees, up to $500, for being, using evasive measures to dodge obstacles in the roadway? If they can't or don't want to pay the fine, will they then be forced to take a day off work to attend traffic court? That just doesn't seem fair, especially to those who are working hard to make ends meet and can't afford a fine or time off. Laws against texting while driving have proven ineffective. There are more effective ways to change behavior. For example, sponsoring public service announcements to educate people about the dangers of distracted driving or messaging in schools, since most texting occurs uh, while driving accidents happen to younger drivers. Even more promising are technology solutions by automakers, smartphone apps, and cell phone carriers. Toyota is working on technology that will monitor drivers' eyelids to ensure that they're looking at the road. There's other uh, companies working on similar features that if the car starts to get out of its lane, it'll uh, warn the driver. So perhaps in, instead of investing in usually expensive government monitoring systems, which would burden taxpayers and would be outdated by the time that it got installed, the government could instead provide tax incentives to encourage car owners to buy or install some of the newer technology. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? 
All right, that concludes the hearing on MC 2420. We will now begin the hearing on MC 2620, Montgomery County Public Safety Building used for agritourism, um, requested on behalf of the Montgomery County government. And I'll ask Amy Salmon um, and Jeremy Chris to come forward. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the county delegation. Amy Smann on behalf of Montgomery County. Um, I'm hoping that this is a fairly straightforward hearing on this bill. This is simply codifying existing practice in the county. Um, this would add Montgomery County to a list of 17 counties that are exempt from adhering to certain Maryland building performance standards, um, as well as exempting them from a change of occupancy permit for just agriculture agritourism um, when it is a subordinate use in an existing agricultural building. Um, currently, um, the county is operating under a Department of Permitting Services code interpretation policy. It's very similar to the statute. Um, we believe that codifying it um, would then take care of any uh, clarification issues with the bill. The county supports the bill. Are you planning to testify or just there to answer questions? I'm here for information. I'm Jeremy Chris. I'm with the Office of Agriculture. And the only thing is uh, the occupancies for these buildings have to be less than 50 people. So this, this will provide flexibility for very small venues and buildings associated with the venues uh, to uh, be exempt from having to get commercial building permits, which can be very expensive and trigger many uh, requirements in our code. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? All right. This concludes the hearing on MC 2620, and I believe those are all of the bills in the Land Use Committee. I'll turn it back over to Chair Corman. Nice job on that marathon. Uh, <laughs> we'll now go to our final slate of bills for the evening from the Metro Washington Area Committee, uh, Vice Chair of the full delegation and Chair of the Committee, Chair Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're going to go a little bit out of order for the bills. Uh, next one I'll mention is PGMC 108-20. That's uh, uh, Park and Planning Commission Summer Math Reading Science Pilot Program. That's a bill that was rec requested by Delegate Valentino Smith. It's a bill that only affects Prince George's County. And we've been in touch with the sponsor. She's unable to, uh, to come tonight, uh, but that's usually how it goes with uh, uh, by-county bills that are introduced by a member of the delegation of the other county. So uh, that concludes the hearing on that bill, unless there's anyone else uh, who really wants to speak to it. The next bill is uh, PGMC 105-20, Income Tax Subtraction Modification, and uh, that is requested by Delegate uh, Lidke and Jackson and Zucker. This is the first time I've seen a bill with uh, legislators from two different counties listed. Take it away, Delegate Lutke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I have coming up, uh, there was a mistake on the, uh, the sign-up order. Uh, Mike Young from the FOP Lodge 30, which represents the, the Park Police, and uh, Guy Andes from the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. Um, and he's not signed up to testify, but the chief of the WSSC police is also here for questions. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a bill that is really just a matter of fairness, um, and it's similar to a bill that we actually passed last year. Last year, you'll recall, we passed a bill um, that uh, to clarify a, a, a property tax credit that existed in state law that allowed for a, a property tax credit for uh, police officers who lived in the jurisdictions in which they served, but when that law had been created, uh, the sponsor, which was me, neglected to recall that we had some agencies that were by-county agencies, and because of the wording of the bill, they, the officers who served those agencies uh, were not eligible for that tax credit. Um, so we clarified, closed that loophole last year, um, and then um, uh, Mike <laughs> came to Senator Zucker and Delegate Jackson and I and said, well, there's this other tax credit that exists in state law that also does not address 
uh, the officers who serve the Park Police and the WSSC Police. Um, and that is what this bill is intended to address. Uh, it relates to a subtraction modification from the income tax um, for uh, officers who live in jurisdictions with a higher than average crime rate. Um, essentially, the point of this bill is, you know, if, if we want local police to have this opportunity, if they work for the Montgomery County Police or the Tacoma Park Police, they should also have that opportunity if they work for the Park Police or the WSSC Police. And we'd ask for a favorable report. Thank you very much, Delegate Lukey. Just for the record, Senator Craig Zucker, uh, we uh, really appreciate everything uh, men and women in public safety do. Uh, we want to keep them in Maryland, and we want to um, provide as much uh, appreciation and uh, assistance we can to making sure that um, we uh, have tax fairness, and this is just, a, a, we believe, a, an easy way of providing tax fairness across the board. I consider just uh, closing a loophole. And with that, I'd ask for a favorable report. I'll turn it over to uh, either Guy or Mr. Uh, Mr. Young. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Young. I'm the president of Fraternal Order Police Lodge 30, representing the men and women of the Maryland National Capital Park Police in both Montgomery's and Prince George's counties. Uh, it, everything, I'd, I'd be redundant to follow up. Um, as, as is common the case with our police department, is we're overlooked in many of these bills, and this is just an instance of us closing that one area in law and including my members uh, for, that live in the counties and hopefully would be able to take uh, advantage of this this benefit. So thank you. I ask for uh, a favorable report and I'll stand for any questions if you have any. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the delegation. Guy Andes, Government Affairs Manager of, on behalf of WSSC. Uh, we are here in support of the legislation as this uh, bill uh, is in line with two of the Commission's strategic, strategic priorities of inspiring employee engagement and protecting our people, infrastructure, systems, and resources. And with me tonight, I have Chief Birdstorm, who's here to answer any questions you may have. He also has a brief statement that he would like to read, and uh, thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Joe Bergstrom. I'm the uh, Chief of Police for WSSC's Police and Homeland Security. And I wanted to simply just say that WSSC does support this bill, and we want to thank the bill sponsors on behalf of the 22 officers that we have, and 20 of which that live in the sanitary district itself. Okay. Uh, are there any questions for this panel? Okay. See, seeing none, <laughs> thank you very much, and that concludes uh, the bill hearing on that bill. I'll turn it over to our chair. Great. We will now move to the bill hearing on PGMC 101-20, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission Mandatory Referral Review. Delegate Carr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, delegates, for your attention on the PGMC 101-20. If this bill looks familiar, it's because it is identical to a bill that we amended and passed unanimously in the uh, 2019 session. Uh, that bill did not advance uh, for a number of reasons, so I'm introducing it again. It basically closes a loophole in the mandatory referral process by which governmental agencies um, are, have a public review by uh, uh, park and planning and public input for their projects. It's advisory. But under the current law, it is uh, possible for an agency, say, State Highway Administration, who's wanting to widen the Beltway or something like that, to um, submit a mandatory referral application that's incomplete uh, on a cocktail napkin. And if park and planning says, well, that this is incomplete, then that agency just has to wait 60 days and uh, it's deemed approved and they can bypass that public review process. So uh, I ask you once again to support uh, this, uh, uh, this bill and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Terrific. That concludes the bill hearing on PGMC 101-20. We'll move on to the bill hearing on PGMC 102-20, by county commission and a report conflict of interest lobbying requested by Delegate Carr, and we'll also call up Guy Andes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for hearing PGMC 102-20. So under current law, there are certain reports required by our three bi-county commissions that have to do with uh, lobbying and conflict of interest. This bill doesn't change that. It just requires that those uh, reports that are already in the law would get published on the website of each of those uh, commissions. So just a simple measure to increase transparency. It basically codifies uh, what WSSC is uh, already practicing. They're, I think they're the gold standard of putting this information out there and uh, making it accessible. And this would help to ensure that the information is, is uh, presented in that same way for all three agencies. I support WSSC's suggestion that we slightly t tweak the the due date to April 30th each year to better match up with uh, other reporting requirements. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Guy Andes on behalf of WSSC. Uh, we are, you have our written testimony in your packet. We are here in support with amendments of uh, PGMC 10220 that would require these reports, these annual reports to be filed within uh, by April 30th, which would make it consistent with all the boards and commissions throughout the state. Thank you very much. It's terrific to see you two in agreement. Are there any questions? <laughs> Great. That concludes the bill here on PGMC 102-20. We'll move on to our last bill of the evening, PGMC 10320 WSSC, discrimination prohibited requested by delegates Carr and Polakovich Carr. <laughs> Team um, Carr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you all for uh, – for, um, Sticking with us to the last bill of the day, PGMC 103-20. So just to tell a little bit of the story, we've had a number of these bills over the past several sessions to strengthen the anti-discrimination provisions in the WSSC statute. In 2017, we added three categories, which was, uh, I believe it was uh, religion, marital status, and gender identity to uh, the WSSC uh, statute, and that was already in uh, the state code, the county code. Um, not all those things were in the Prince George's code, but uh, anyway, that's what we did to, um, to, to strengthen it, make it more consistent, and then uh, we actually uh, left off um, a couple of uh, categories. The county specifically asked us to add another category, which is genetic information or sometimes called genetic status to the uh, anti-discrimination categories. So what this bill does is to do exactly that. It, uh, to add, it adds that additional category of uh, genetic information uh, to protections for employees of WSSC, customers of WSSC, and also the, the employees of the vendors of WSSC. Um, and uh, another category that is in the uh, county code and the city of Rockville code is, is called presence of children. So this bill also adds the category of presence of children uh, to the protections uh, for WSSC's uh, customers. Um, so again, the goal is just to strengthen uh, those, those provisions. Uh, I'll now hand it over to Delegate Balagovich Carr. So I think the only thing that I'll add is that the bill isn't meant to imply that WSSC has uh, done anything wrong to date on this front. This really is a prospective bill that is looking to strengthen our laws. This is a good way to, to message and to show to the community um, that we are taking a broad look and in terms of ensuring that discrimination is not happening. So I think it's important to have these additional classes um, added. Uh, just as some context in the city of Rockville a, a few years ago we actually went through this exercise again not because there was some specific problem um, but to just make sure that our city charter actually included all of the categories that we as a community thought were important in terms of protecting against discrimination so I think this bill further fleshes that out in terms of WSFC's policies. Delia Kaiser. Thank you both very much. Um, I'm, I'm just a little confused in terms of when it comes to discrimination uh, pertaining to employment, does the county use this presence of children language or family responsibilities? How, how interesting, Delegate, that you are uh, mentioning a WSSC talking point. Um, so the, um, the way I read the county code, uh, 
uh, for the Commission on Human Relations, that's just one of the broad categories that the uh, the county is uh, protecting discrimination against. Uh, and so we're echoing that here. Um, and I know the county does mention it in the context of housing, um, but uh, my read is that it also is in one of the broad uh, categories of anti-discrimination uh, in the county's code. Are you? I'm good. Okay, any other questions? Great, thank you both. Our final uh, panelist is Guy Andes with informational testimony. Good evening, I won't belabor the point. Guy Andes uh, on behalf of WSSC Water. I just wanna to like to point out that WSSC cannot discriminate against our customers in any way, shape or form in, when it comes to the services that we provide to, to those individuals. We can't, if, if the county's determined that, that water and or sewer service needs to be taken to a certain area, we must take it there. Uh, who, uh, uh, I just want to put that on the, on the table right out the, right the get. Two things. Yes, Delegate Carr, the, the uh, Human Rights Commission does speak of uh, family responsibilities and presence of children, but that's in the scope, in the, in the statement of policy, in specific, to the presence of children, that is only in the code uh, pertaining to commercial real estate and public housing. When it become, when it talks about employment, discrimination is based on family responsibilities, which is a much broader topic than the presence of children, which is just as uh, defined in the bill under the age of 18. If we're gonna be consistent, which has been told to us by the bill sponsors that they wanna be consistent with Montgomery County code uh, to uh, WSSC statute, we believe that uh, the presence of children does not provide uh, provides an inconsistency on, on, on that that portion of it. Second, uh, the term genetic information is not defined in the bill. I believe that this was brought up by the county executive as well that they would like to see some type of de uh, uh, definition of what genetic information is. Uh, Right now, the commission has vetted this bill. They are waiting on more information because of these inconsistencies when it deals with presence of children and family responsibilities or familial status as the state uses. Uh, and we would look forward to further conversations with the bill sponsors and how we can come to a uh, resolution on this matter. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, any questions? Great, that concludes the bill hearing. Just a reminder to all my colleagues, we're back here in exactly one week minus a few hours. Thank you, see you then. In circuit court was opened up what we call kids spot and it's a it's a actual daycare center